International Center for Automotive Technology, ICAD. The most populous democracy in the world, the Republic of India, is a vast South Asian country with diverse terrain ranging from the Himalayan peaks to Indian Ocean coastline and a history dating back five millennia. A cultural melting pot, it is a pluralistic, multilingual and multi-ethnic society which became one of the fastest growing major economies post-market-based economic reforms in 1991. A key contributor to this enviable position is the automotive industry which accounts for 7.1% of the country's gross domestic product, GDP. Located at the northern hub of automotive industry in Manesar, Haryana, ICAD has emerged as a comprehensive technical partner to the automotive industry and renders valuable services such as homologation and certification, developmental projects and testing and automotive R&D projects. The state-of-the-art infrastructure at ICAD is pivotal in carrying out these functions and can be broadly classified into following areas of excellence. Powertrain Laboratory Powertrain Lab offers services in the fields of vehicle and engine emission and performance test along with calibration services. The labs are fully equipped to undertake the homologation test of both the engine and the vehicle as per latest Indian, European and other international regulations of automobiles. Apart from homologation, performance measurement of engine and vehicle, fuel consumption measurement and optimization, emission tests and optimization including EGR, engine mapping, exhaust temperature optimization and ECU calibration of vehicles. Engine test cell, ETC. There are 13 transient test cells ranging from 35 kilowatt to 880 kilowatt capacity. These engine test cells are capable of carrying out advanced tests such as performance, optimization, emissions measurements, EGR and SCR optimization, durability and validation for engines for various automotive and no automotive applications. Vehicle Test Cell VTC There are six emissions vehicle chassis dynamometers and three mileage chassis dynamometers capable of testing vehicles up to 5,000 kg GBW. Each test cell is equipped to test and check various emission parameters such as hydrocarbon, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxides and particulates as per BS6 and Euro 6 norms and durability and validation. The lab is also equipped for an on-road emission performance. Vehicle Evaluation Lab VEL. Vehicle Evaluation Lab undertakes key tests including coast down, brake performance, maximum speed, fuel consumption, acceleration and performance, drivability trials, tire noise testing, endurance and durability tests, ABS test, etc. as per the specific needs of the customer on test tracks. Component Certification Lab, CCL Component Certification Lab, CCL provides services related to certification and homologation of automotive components. As per Central Motor Vehicle Rules, CMVR, the lab undertakes developmental testing, environmental testing, vibration testing, hot and cold chamber, weatherometer, ozone chamber, salt spray chamber, walk-in chamber, etc. for all components for on-road and off-road vehicles. Photometry Lab Photometry Lab at IGAT is the state-of-the-art facility and one of the finest in the world. Fundamental research is carried out on LED measurement methods, spectroradiometric measurements techniques, visibility and glare, headlamp aiming, conspicuity, telematics, etc. Not only does the lab cater to automotive lighting, 
but also provides testing and development services to non-automotive applications, which includes domestic lighting and aviation lighting. Materials Lab Multiple facilities available here in Materials Lab include mechanical testing of rubbers and plastics, coolant test facility, chemical testing of polymers, flammability testing of upholstery, carpet materials as well as inner components, wiring harness for kits used in automotive, two, three and four wheelers etc. Fatigue Lab in order to ascertain the life of products, extensive tests are undertaken by OEMs and their vendors. These tests include durability and integrity assessment of vehicles, systems and subsystems under various driving and environmental condition. Fatigue Lab in ICAT has state-of-the-art facility, wherein you can bring in road to the lab evaluation, multi-axis simulation tables, Exposters and various actuators in various simulated environmental conditions make this possible. Electromagnetic Compatibility Lab EMC. The application of electronics has significantly increased in automobiles over last few decades. In view of this, the electromagnetic compatibility compliance has become of paramount importance both at the device as well as vehicle level. Passive Safety Lab simulates various crash scenarios. This is to ensure occupant and pedestrian protection in the event when a vehicle encounters a crash and the ability of the vehicle structure to absorb the energy of the impact. Some of the services offered are frontal impact crash test, side impact crash test, side pole impact, rear impact test, static rollover, pedestrian protection testing, etc. A notable point is that ICAN was the first organization to set up pedestrian safety lab in India. Tire Test Lab Tire being crucial for the road safety, comfort and fuel economy of the vehicle needs to undergo a comprehensive and rigorous testing to evaluate and ensure its adequate performance. Both performance and rolling resistance evaluation of tires for various category of vehicles is undertaken in this lab. Noise, Vibration and Harshness Lab A center of excellence on noise, vibration and harshness, NVH, is the first of its kind of facility in India to offer services for development of vehicles in components, testing and validation. The lab is equipped with the semi-anechoic chambers with chassis dynamometers and state-of-the-art equipment and instrumentation. Automotive Electronics and Electrical Lab the AEEL at ICAT is one of the most important lab considering the rapid increase in the use of electrical and electronics in the vehicles. The major facilities available at AEEL are related to electrical measurements, ECU validation, environmental testing, altitude testing, dust and water ingress testing, thermal shock, vibration and shock testing, weather resistance, battery cyclers, and motor test benches, etc. CAD CAE Lab CAD CAE Lab helps in design and development of vehicle and its component. Here components and vehicles are not only tested virtually but also studied for modification and optimization if required. Apart from virtual testing, it offers other services such as CAD modeling, drawings, fixtures and structure design. ICAT is poised to develop into automotive development center not only to provide certification services but also product development services to Indian and global OEMS. At ICAT, we constantly strive for excellence both in terms of building facilities and building matching skills. International Center for Automotive Technology ICAT
morning samir i can't hear you good morning ma'am yeah yeah now i can hear you अमृता श्रद्धी आई थिंक वी शुड स्टार्ट नाउ distinguished delegates eminent speakers ladies and gentlemen a very good morning to all of you on behalf of international center for automotive technology i unniti yadav extend a very warm welcome to all of you for joining us today for the webinar on fatigue durability 
that is being organized by icat as a part of azadi ka amrit mahotsav celebration which marks the 75th anniversary of our independence as we all are celebrating azadi ka amrit mahotsav week from 10th jan to 16th jan 2022 and it's the third webinar in the context of informational and educational webinar in this mahotsav we have also received the message from the honorable minister dr mahindra nath pandey and honorable minister of state shri krishna pal gujjar ministry of heavy industries government of india fueled by the spirit of atmanirbhar bharat mission and the message wordings are azadi ka amrit mahotsav pragatishil bharat ke 75ve varsh ka utsav banane aur janata sanskriti tatha desh ki uplabdhiyon ke gauravshali itihas ko smaran karne ki bharat sarkar ki ek pehal hai इसी पहल के तहत भारी उद्योग मंत्रालय 10 से 16 जनवरी 2022 तक आजादी का अमृत महोत्सव मना रहा है भारी उद्योग मंत्रालय ऑटोमोटिव और कैपिटल गुड्स क्षेत्र सहित विश्व स्तर पर प्रतिस्पर्धी हरित अंत और तकनीकी आधारित विनिर्माण क्षेत्र के विकास पर ध्यान केंद्रित कर रहा है जिससे विकास और रोजगार सृजन को बढ़ावा मिलता है इस विजन को साकार करने के लिए मंत्रालय ने भारत में इलेक्ट्रिक वाहनों का तीव्र अंगीकरण और विनिर्माण स्कीम राष्ट्र उन्नत केमिस्ट्री सेल एसीसी बैटरी भंडार कार्यक्रम ऑटोमोबाइल और ऑटो घटन के लिए उत्पादन संबंधित प्रोत्साहन पीएलआई स्कीम भारतीय कैपिटल गुड्स क्षेत्र से प्रतिस्पर्धी संवर्धन स्कीम आदि सहित कई पहले शुरू की हैं। भारतीय उद्योग मंत्रालय ने अपने सी और स्वायत्त निकायों के सहयोग से आजादी का अमृत महोत्सव के समारोह के लिए नवाचार विनिर्माण उत्कृष्टता आत्मनिर्भर भारत पर्यावरण और वही नेता स्वच्छ भारत स्वस्थ भारत स्वतंत्रता संग्राम आदि विषय पर ध्यान केंद्रित करते हुए 10 से 16 जनवरी 2022 के सप्ताह के दौरान देश भर में 40 से अधिक स्थानों पर एक्शन 75, अचीवमेंट 75, फाइव 75 और रिजॉल्व 75 जैसे विषयों को केंद्र में रखते हुए कार्यक्रम कार्यक्रमों और क्रियाकलापों की श्रृंखला की योजना बनाई है इस कार्यक्रमों में लोकार्पण नए उत्पाद उत्पादों की शुरुआत प्रौद्योगिकी स्वतंत्रता सेनानी नायकों को याद करना स्वतंत्रता संग्राम और आंदोलनों आदि पर बच्चों के बीच सांस्कृतिक कार्यक्रम स्वच्छता अभियान और प्रतियोगिताओं का आयोजन करना इत्यादि शामिल है यह सुनिश्चित करने पर जोर दिया गया है कि सप्ताह भर चलने वाले इस समारोह का आयोजन होल ऑफ गवर्नमेंट अप्रोच से किया जाए और सभी कार्यक्रमों में जन भागीदारी हो कार्यक्रमों के दौरान कोविड 19 के अनुरूप परस्पर सुरक्षित दूरी बनाए रखें और स्वच्छता प्रोटोकॉल सुनिश्चित करने के निर्देश भी जारी किए गए हैं हमारा अनुरोध है की आप सब आजादी का अमृत महोत्सव के तहत दिनांक 10 से 16 जनवरी 2022 तक भारी उद्योग मंत्रालय के इस आयोजन में अपनी सहभागिता अवश्य करें दिस वेबिनार इज एन इनिशिएटिव फॉर द बेनिफिट ऑफ इंडस्ट्री स्टार्टअप्स एंड अकेडमिया इट फर्दर री एनफोर्सेज एंड कमिटमेंट टूवर्ड्स आत्मनिर्भर भारत मिशन इन द टेक्नोलॉजी एरिया This webinar aims to provide a common platform to deliberate on various topics related to durability testing, data acquisition techniques, accelerated duty cycle creation, life prediction, damage correlation, etc. in various type of automotives like two wheelers, three wheelers, and four wheelers, agriculture, farm equipments, construction equipments, etc. and it would also showcase ICAT capability to execute these tests along with the case studies. Ladies and gentlemen we will now commence the inaugural session we will first begin the digital lamp lighting ceremony with the ganesh lord ganesh vandana may i request for the digital lamp lighting ceremony with lord ganesh vandana please बट साउंड क्यों नहीं आ रहा इसमें
thank you on this auspicious note i would like to request shri dinesh tyagi director icat for the welcome address sir please good morning ladies and gentlemen it gives me immense pleasure to extend a warm welcome to our distinguished speakers and attendees on behalf of icat we are grateful to you for accepting this invitation for webinar on fatigue durability 2022 as a part of azadi ka amrit mahotsav a kam celebration azadi ka amrit mahotsav is an initiative of the government of india to celebrate and commemorate 75 years of progressive india and the glorious history of its people culture and achievements only a country that takes pride in its culture and heritage can progress as it goes a long way to facilitate harmony and teamwork this mahotsav is dedicated to the people of india who have not only been instrumental in bringing india this far in its revolutionary journey since independence but also hold within them the power and potential to enable honorable prime minister shri narendra modi's vision of activating india 2.0 fueled by the spirit of atmanirbhar bharat icat has fast emerged as a comprehensive technical test partner to the automotive industry and is engaged in the various activities of automotive certification research and development testing and validation icat has state of the art facilities for testing of the whole vehicle systems subsystems and components we support unique and specific testing needs of the industry who are the integral part of this current localization renaissance created with atmanirbhar bharat and make in india with an ever growing automotive market and the advent of electric mobility a stiff competition between the indian and global players operating in india is increasing while new oems are also emerging icat is fully geared up to test validate develop and certify new technology products with adequate capacity and capability i'm sure that this webinar will be helpful to all the participants who will be able to gain knowledge over the next few hours via presentations covering many aspects of fatigue and durability in product development and validation testing i hope this webinar brings out the desired outcome to enable attendees to enhance their domain knowledge I request you to provide your valuable inputs regarding your current and future testing needs. This will help us to facilitate the required test facilities and to align our future investments in line with your needs. I would once again like to take this opportunity to express my sincere thanks to the speakers and all the attendees who are participating in this webinar despite of their busy schedule. Thank you very much. जय भारत थैंक यू सर फॉर सेटिंग शेयरिंग व्यूज ऑफ द वेबिनार इन मोशन विद द इन लाइटिंग इन ऑर्गनल एड्रेस वी ऑल्सो थैंक यू फॉर ऑल योर सपोर्ट एंड गाइडेंस इन ऑर्गेनाइजिंग दिस वेबिनार thank you once again sir now moving ahead to the technical lecture we will start with the main presentation now we have six presentation of 30 minutes each followed by the question and answer session of 30 minutes if you have any question during the presentation i would request you to kindly write them in a question section along with the name of the speaker they are addressed to we will take that question on your behalf for all your presentations i would now request all the speaker of the session to kindly keep their presentation ready 
I'm sure that the immense knowledge in this presentation will give us all a better understanding on fatigue durability. Now for the first presentation of the webinar, I would like to welcome Mr. Shatya Prakash. Mr. Prakash has completed BE from Missouri University and MTech from IIT Madras. He has more than 35 years of experience. <clears throat> at present, Mr. Prakash is working as a Chief Technical Officer at Mahesh Software System Private Limited in Pune. His areas of expertise and skills are Road load data acquisition system, test data analysis in vehicle, fatigue analysis based on test measurement and CA based fatigue predictions, fatigue testing plans, schedule based on test data, test versus CA correlation, road to proving ground to rig correlation, uncertainty qualification as related to the product design and development and to end consulting on fatigue related issues. A specialized training and techniques, knowledge transfer program with industries and mentoring. Mr. Prakash, I welcome you, sir. Mr. Prakash will be presenting on predictive analysis for modern engineering. I now request Mr. Prakash to please proceed with his presentation, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very kind introductions. So uh, I just want to ask you if my, uh, can you tell me that if my screen is visible? Yes, sir, your screen is visible and you are audible. And, and, and in, the, in, the, in the presentation mode? Yes, sir, in presentation mode. In presentation mode, so, okay. So, thank you very much. So with, with your permission, sure. I would like to start the session of the day. Sure, sir. So, Yes, please. So, okay. Yeah. So, I hope I am audible. Sir, so you are audible. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So, so let's go ahead. First of all, uh, thanks to ICAT uh, and the ICAT team. Uh, for this wonderful opportunity to be here this morning uh, before all of you and uh, trying to uh, look at the, the way ICAT, uh, we have been working with ICAT for quite some time right from the, its day of inceptions and then we, we have a lot, over the years um, we had a lot of interactions with ICAT and we are always happy to be a part of any of the ICAT's uh, success program which we have been uh, for the last few years and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. So uh, uh, the, the program, what I'm entitled today means what I've chosen for the day. <clears throat> it is something which is relative to predictive analytics for modern engineering. So what I would deal be with, how do you use the predictive analytics and and which will help us in during design and manufacture of all the modern kind of vehicle systems. And apart from whatever, modern engineering methods we are following. So now today with the machine learning uh, and the uh, advanced uh, uh, and the artificial intelligence coming into picture in a, in a very broad way and in a very rapid way. So even in all aspects of modern engineering, a lot of data analytics has picked up. So this is one such tool so where which will help us in design and develop of our systems in a very faster way and then with, with more accent on quality, reliability, and what is intended for the purpose. So predictive analytics, what it means is it encompasses a set of advanced analytic techniques, so which uh, basically are used for a development of a predictive model. So there is a predictive model all the time. There is a model all the time. It can be simulation, so it can be a test. So it can be a combination of both. So in real time, so using all the data which we have either from tests or simulation, if you are able to in real time uh, have a model so which will analyze uh, all aspects of the design in a very fast way, which will be able to predict a lot of future things which would, uh, which would otherwise lead quite a lot of time and efforts. So this is the basis for predictive analytics. And this being data agnostic in nature, you can use all types of data sets such as simulation modeling, 
data from manufacturing, data from any of the sensor data during operations. And using all this data, you can actually uh, uh, set up a trained predictive model using all the latest machine learning techniques, and you can quickly perform very complex predictive analytics. So the, actually, the meaning of a predictive model is so these models are trained to mimic complex engineering simulations. So if there is a very complex engineering simulations, think that a whole vehicle is being simulated, let's say, for example, to run on a road. So with all the kinds of available data, so you can train and make a statistical model which will be predictive. So instead of every time going back into your simulations, you can feed the data into the predictive model. And absolutely in real time, you'll be able to get uh, outputs and which will help us make a lot of engineering decisions. So, so these are some of the few applications which are being used today worldwide in the industry. So simulation model, validation and the calibration and use of virtual sensors on the automotives and a predictive maintenance and many of the root cause analysis. And we have heard today these are the buzzwords, the digital twins. So digital twins are nothing but a digital replica or a trained model, so which will represent the actual system in place. So which helps us quite in real time once we put the actual real world data into a digital twin. So without it, it will mimic the actual complex engineering what goes behind it. So this is a standard product development cycle, which all of us are aware of this. So right from concept design uh, to the systems engineering and vehicle integration, prototyping, testing, validation, and the final remote. So every aspect of it has got this, the, the traditional PDCA cycle, which is plan, do, check, and act. So every time we plan something, do something, and check for its correctness, and if there is a problem, they give the feedback and it keeps on. So this whole thing within within each of the concept cycle, the whole thing keeps on churning together. So until we get a churned and a completely product which is readily validated and tested and foolproofed and it is very it's ready for the end user. So this is nothing. This is nothing new. This is a standard engineering cycle. And now coming to this webinar, which is especially on durability, what could I have tried to put in is how to, for example, how to imbibe this kind of predictive analytics practices where both test and CAE are combined in durability. So this is a standard durability cycle where you're having loads and measurements which come either from a test or from a field measurement. Then you've got the traditional data analysis to compress and hold the and understand the raw data. So this raw data is further synthesized and you give it, get you into a physical fatigue, fatigue test or a fatigue life test for a durability. At the same time, the same data will also go into a CAE a based a fatigue analysis. And then ideally, you would want to compare what is the fatigue life from a virtual world and from a real world. And the, the more the correlation, the better. So now, uh, dura whether it's durability or any aspect of uh, vehicle design, so we're all aware that simulation is a very, very important part. So we cannot do away with simulation. Simulation Actually, it is, it, is, it is one thing which will improve the speed at which we can develop the components, which is nothing new. So now, what is the new thing here? What is coming into this is the uncertainty. So the uncertainty is everywhere. So when you measure, measure the loads in the field, there is uncertainty. Uncertainty is measurement. Uncertainty in numerical. Uncertainty where software works. Uncertainty in a physical test. Uncertainty in some of the FE solvers. So uncertainty in testing. So ultimately, whatever inputs are going into every aspect of it, there is uncertainty. So unless we understand and try to quantify what is this uncertainty, we'll be never be able to. So now the we'll never be able to build a predictive model. Now the aim of this exercise is this whole thing, whatever we are doing. See, at every stage there is lots of data. So so imagine a system or a model where all this data can be plugged in. And instead of doing a physical test or a, even a virtual CAE test, instantly when you feed this real-time data into your model, out comes the actual results, so which, is, which is coming out of a trained model. So that means that the, the, this is the basic, this is the heart of any uh, predictive analytics tool. So why at all we should use this kind of a predictive or a probabilistic analysis? Because why, why we also call it as a probabilistic analysis is we are, we are able to do a lot of what if and where if and how if the solutions to this. 
So what if my input changes? What if my vehicle speed changes? What if my vehicle load changes? What if my fillet radius changes? So example, there are so many design parameters. So unless we use a trained model, a trained predictive model, and use a, the, the modern state of art, no probabilistic analytics, so we'll be never be able to do a product development time. So this has been a traditional fatigue development, sorry, product development time where ultimately it will culminate in physical testing. Now with simulation, so you're bringing down the actual production time. So now into this simulation, you are you add the uncertainty quantification and predictive analytics. Further, you can bring down the time. So this is the reason why somebody should be doing it all. So as far as uncertainty is concerned, so what is uncertainty? Uncertainty is like as the name says, no, it's the lack of certainty. That means there is a state of limited knowledge where it is impossible to exactly describe the existing state. So when the current state I'm not able to exactly with certainty I'm not able to define. So it will practically be impossible to see from that current state. So what will be the future outcome? So this, this is a, just a general thing. Uncertainty is everywhere. So it is like you know, coming to coming to a fork in a road. So which which road to take? Left side or road side? You do not know. My future is uncertain. So imagine a system where I can know this uncertainty. I can quantify this uncertainty quite ahead of time. And then I will know exactly what happens when I go on this road, what happens when I go and take this road, what happens. So this is where a lot of predictive analytics and machine learning comes into picture. See, uncertainty is everywhere, be it natural disasters or some of the public health crises like the current pandemic human behavior, the economy itself, new governmental policies, international relations. So the stocks and shares market so everywhere there is uncertainty. So uh, 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 uncertainty will affect the decision at every level. And this will affect like the supply chains or public health, the product reliability and ignoring uncertainty when you are doing simulation and analysis. This can mislead decision makers and which will result in a very, very costly outcome. So it is imperative we do that. So as far as engineering is concerned, there is uncertainties which are existing at all the engine, all the engineering data sets. Example, simulation. Simulation will have some initial conditions, some boundary conditions, some parameter, model itself. And added to all that, there is numerical solver uncertainty. So how do you take? which are the ones which are coming into place and how do you ensure this and next phase comes the testing there could be sensor error uncertainty in measurement experimental error then the manufacturing then the machine learning and the ai models then the digital twins themselves what you set up so the whole world whole world there is a lot of uncertainty everywhere so so when we try to imbibe this concept into our process so we will know exactly where are the uncertainties based made like a systems engineering uncertainty which can cause like you know, costly accidents or in the uncertainty can be there in the engineering design and analysis itself so like some of these uh, uh, the famous uh, failures which has opened the way the, the way more uh, engineering research is done taking into account the added factors which can come into design so these are the concepts which have come into practice today in this in the world and then which has made all aspects of modern engineering rely more and more on data. So it is not just the data, but the quality of data and what do we do with so much data. So uncertainty is in manufacturing. So manufacturing, so there are many complex parts where every part on part it is exactly no, not it is impossible to maintain the very very strict geometric tolerances so for this how do you deal with those kind of uncertainty non comparability geometric dimensioning so two things can happen one thing is the 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 products what we design so they they go out of the conformance very quickly and second thing is and they fail fast and the customer is definitely unhappy with that Second thing will be it is a huge scrap rate and will not be able to maintain the productivity. So at every stage we need to qualify that. So the most important thing for this is uh, uh, into our system of the, uh, the, the in, into our design process. So we have to imbibe or we have to include 
the concept of an uncertainty quantificant. This is the additional process which today in today's data world becomes very important. Be it simulation or physical test or in the manufacturing or field operations. So all this data can come in which can make our future predictions and decision making quite easy. So in fact, this is the definition given by NAFEMS. Uh, and the ASME for the, as far as uncertainty quantification is concerned. So it says that UQ uncertainty quantification is nothing but it's a formulation of a statistical model or which is or a machine learning model with which you can characterize the imperfectness or you can characterize what is unknown in the system. So example, let's consider the, the concept here. What I have put a small concept here. So as far as the designer is concerned, so he designs a, he designs a part wherein the strength will vary only this small. So he'll control all the design aspects, and then once he makes the calculations and releases the design as per his calculations, so the strength of the part uh, should only vary this small amount. So he has taken he feels that he or she has taken or the designer has taken all the aspects into consideration. Then further, when you start making the part, there is uncertainty in material properties, means now your scatter increases and uncertainty in the manufacturing process, your scatter increases further. Uncertainty is when you integrate this part with your system. And then uncertainty is when you actually use the part due to operations and due to environmental factor. Now, ultimately what has happened, whatever the small scatter which the designer assumed initially when designing the part, now the scatter is very wide. Because there has to be a system which can quantify and take care of uncertainty at every level so that means we should be able to understand what was the scatter what would be the scatter when in the material property or in the manufacturing or during operations so for all of this lots of data will be required so how uh, this was the main objective is how likely are certain outcomes if some aspects of a very complex system are not known so this is the reason a determinist approach will always not give a realistic result. So just to carry the same example forward. So let's imagine that uh, this is the strength of the component which, which, which has been designed. And then this is the estimated load on the component. So, the, so currently, yes, there is a strength to load factor of safety, which is like 1.5. So you agree and you release the design. Now what is happening is actually in practice the load is very so there could be a small portion of the loads you know, which are exceeding the strength so which would result in a small portion of the failure so for the sake of let's say for the sake of argument let's imagine that this is a small five percent so in five percent of the usage cases my loads are going beyond the strength requirement so 5% there could be a failure. Okay, probably this could be a risk which somebody can accept. So these are due to uncertainty in the loads. Then during due to manufacturing, so the strength itself will be uncertain. So what happens in this interface? Retrieval? So there's a huge chance. There's a very, very big chance that the majority of the product should fail. It would not meet the specification. So which will give us an understanding that yes, the whatever process, the deterministic process we followed, it really does not suit our process because we have not been able to quantify the uncertainty of every variable. So this is where a probabilistic approach, so which will provide very highly realistic information and we'll be able to account all the changes which will be there in the component at every stage of manufacturing usage. So bring that into the design process and we'll be able to understand the better. So, what are the requirements uh, in, a, in a total predictive analytics situation? Suppose you want to introduce predictive analytics and modeling into your, into your engineering system. So what are the requirements? So first thing is we we'll need a lot of data. So this data, two ways are telling. The source of data can be either a simulation or a test, or it can come from both. So there will be a lot of existing data. So you put all that in place. And along with that, there are a lot of data which can come from the properties of system. And for a more intelligent handling of this, so we need to do a lot of data sampling, intelligent data sampling and carry out a lot of DOEs or design of experiments. So design of experiment is nothing but, I, if you know that, yes, there are so many parameters which are going, various 
parameters which are going into the system and each parameter can vary from a parameter A to a parameter B. So we have to make sure that when we generate the data for every parameter, all possible combinations of all the parameters are taken into account. So this is the aspect of DOE. DOE means, yes, we, 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 we introduce a, an intelligent design of experiments wherein a fewer data sampling sets will be able to quantify what goes on in my entire design space. So design space is nothing but to simply say that, yes, I've got 10 different design parameters which are affecting my component. So all 10 are having going through different variations. So I'll take care of all the variations here. So then from that, you are generating the data. And from this data, from the sampling data, the data sampling and from the DOE data, and you go back into your simulation or testing, and from these input DOEs, you generate the required output, and you build a predictive model. So for the predictive model, again, data can be sourced from simulation, testing, or data which can come from field units, operation units, or a combination where the inputs exactly I know what goes on. So for a simulation, we design the inputs. For a, for a lab or a field testing, we design the inputs. Only for a field unit, yes, the data is like could be random and we get the data for that. So we using, using this data, you replicate my whatever is my engineering process. It can be a simple design process. It can be a strength analysis in FE. It can be a durability evaluation. So, you know, so it can be a performance evaluation. It can be an engine performance evaluation. Whatever it is, I've got all the inputs in place in a DOE. I've got all the responses in place. So with this data, you build a predictive model by using the standard machine learning algorithms. So then you use this predictive model and then do further lot of analytics. So what are the analytics you can do? Main thing is you can calibrate the entire system. Second thing is you can carry out a sensitivity analysis. That means out of this, so many input uh, in, input design inputs which are going into the system design. So which one of them are most sensitive? So this will give an information to the designer that if he wants to change the design or improve the design, so which are those sensitive parameters he should tackle rather than tackle the entire range of parameters. Then the most, the most important thing is the uncertainty propagation. So having known how the system behaves with a limited set of DOE and data samples data. So now you can use the, the again, go back to the same machine learning. And now you can quantify the entire system. That means your entire system, complete design space. You can put, you can use practically hundreds and thousands of random samples, like what they come during real time. And then check what happens to your design over the entire thing. So now this is the predictive analytic. So see, this concept is not anything new. So uh, always you, know, you would have heard about what is known as the Monte Carlo approach. So in a Monte Carlo approach, what is done is, so you, you've got a model. It, let's say, let's say for argument's sake, you just imagine that this is a simulation model and I've got different inputs into this simulation. Each one has its own different distributions. So imagine I will have hundreds and thousands of random samples extracted from each distribution from each of these design inputs. And for each combination of that, I'll go into the model and I'll get hundreds and thousands of outputs. And if you plot them and then check from their distribution, so you will be able to quantify. So yes, exactly, yes. To, to what percentage are my uh, output met? So to, to what, what percentage of my input, these random samples do I, do I meet? Does it meet the required design target? What percentage doesn't meet? If it doesn't meet, I can go back here, change the input and come back to it. So now in this process, what we are doing is, so we are using the actual simulation. So we, we the, the disadvantage of a Monte, direct Monte Carlo is, so all these hundreds and thousands of random samples you generate and you go back into simulation or testing and you carry out that many kind number of simulations and generate the data. So in general, in Monte Carlo sampling, it requires many, many samples. If you want to confidently describe the uh, simulation results or a test results. So contrary to this, uh, what you normally follow is because I cannot do hundreds and thousands of simulations 
practically so you follow what is known as the indirect surrogate modeling method so in this method the process is similar except that i do not do random sampling so you do an intelligent sampling which are fired by a, a set of DOEs. So uh, means that these DOEs, intelligent DOEs, are, are design of experiments. So they suggest, if these are the three example, three different parameters, they suggest a few variations of these parameters, which more or less occupy the entire design space. And you use this model and you build the output. So with this very few output, so you go back into your machine learning algorithm and you build a predictive model you check so from this predictive model you check whether this model behavior how is it is it so so if i if i if i give a random input into this model and check the behavior of the response so is it somewhere close to what comes out of a real model real simulation so what is the error so this is what done by the emulator or the machine learning algorithms here so once i am succeeding this now what can be done is you can use this model further and why why a few you can put hundreds and thousands so millions of simulations into this directly into the validation model into the validated emulator and instantly within no time you can know the entire design space what is happening for any combination of this uh, the param input parameters so this is called design space exploration so added to that you can uh, do a sensitivity analysis and you can find out which of these components where is the uncertainty so let's say with 99 percent certainty i want some durability i want some strength i want some performance am i getting that if i'm not getting that i use the sensitivity analysis and go back those sensitive parameters and redo this so while i'm while i redo this i don't go back into my original complex model but I run a very, very fast analysis using my trained emulator. So now, the forming a trained emulator, sorry, trained model, trained statistical model. So now, this is the heart of the any predictive analytics. So worldwide today, most of the aut automotive sectors now started following this. And this has already been there in the aerospace industry for quite some time. It is nothing new to the industry as such. but in the practice especially the automotive industry so now only slowly the the practice of this is catch, catching up so why why should we use machine learning algorithms for this so machine learning algorithms so it's because it is not feasible to directly do let's say hundreds or billions of simulations and so that enormous amount of time is lost and gone we can't spend that time so we build a predictive model using all the machine learning, the latest data analytic techniques. So that's why machine machine learning algorithms are used. So within a very short time, any any distribution of input parameters which can be put into the model. So in practice, this model will represent exactly what is happening inside your vehicle. Let's say this can represent a CAE analysis. This can represent a let's say a durability analysis. This can represent a manufacturing process. This can represent a complete vehicle test. So you can build. All this needs is data in, data out. So with that data and with a set of DOEs which you need to design, so you can build this intelligent model which will become predictive. So now this is how the modern concepts of machine learning are used in engineering today. So and as we have seen earlier, no, this data is this approach is data agnostic so so all it needs is data in and data out data can come from experiments from simulation or it can be historical records or it can come from a survey so the main thing is the, these are the following steps which are involved first thing is collect data through a set of intelligent devices or and through some data sampling techniques then you build an emulator or nothing but a trained predictive model. It's also called an emulator because it emulates your actual physical component. And then you quantify its uncertainty. So once you quantify its uncertainty, then you do all the advanced statistics, uh, analytics with that. So you explore the complete design space with that. Which make sure that you give inputs from each nook and corner of all the uh, design inputs and find out what is happening to the response. Then you do a sensitivity analysis, which will help you uh, understand your product better and do a redesign quickly. 
and what are the uncertainties and it will help you greatly in optimization because i want to achieve something what should be the mix of my input parameters so which will give me that optimize optimized value where my let's say you can optimize on anything optimize on performance optimize on weight optimize on cost optimize on speed it it, it becomes a general mathematical optimization problem so because I already have lots of data and any kind of future data can be generated just by feeding that into the predictive algorithm. So this is the standard workflow what, you, what, what, what can be put in practice. So first stage is data collection. So in the same data through a set of DOEs which are designed again by this machine learning algorithms. So you go into a, use these DOEs and then set up a simulation model and get the actual value or you use this in a physical test. You use the values and then with this you form an emulator, train the emulator. Suppose the emulator accuracy is not enough, then go back into the DOE and you generate more number of parameters, more samples. You feed more data until you get a trained model. Then you explore the design space. So once this forward simulation is done, then what you do is, in a no no in an actual physical test, you will also gather a lot of data. So from a physical test, you have got the input and you have got the response. So you feed this physical data also into the same emulator, and you will be able to calibrate your emulator. Whatever statistical mathematical emulator you did, you can see how efficacy the efficacy or the efficiency or the correctness of that by calibrating this using you by using the, uh, the, uh, the the stochastic and the other calibration techniques Bayesian statistics those kind of techniques and statistical characteristics you can use and statistically calibrate your model with the physical data so in this whole exercise what is happening is you are having a trained emulator which has been calibrated against physical tests also so means practically this emulator will replace your physical system and you, you, you can use this for any kind of analytics in practice. So means th th this is what is happening today in the modern engineering world. So, okay, uh, this logical, what should be the ROI, save time, decrease cost, you are improving the quality, you are reducing the risk study, yes. So now I would like to just illustrate this with a small durability case study, which is apt for this seminar. So I've taken a case study, which is this, this is a this is a proof of concept case study, which we have actually which we have actually carried out. So this pertains to the durability of a front suspension of a vehicle. So a MacPherson suspension. So in which uh, the actual durability and uh, the part under evaluation is the LCA or the lower control arm. So this is fitted on the vehicle and then a lot of steering maneuvers are taken, which will have a lot of cornering clockwise uh, and the counterclockwise cornering routines and also a figure of eight routines. And then data is collected on the uh, uh, tracks, mainly the force data. And then the, the aim is, yes, there has to be, there are some target repeats of uh, track manual. This is my design target. So now, Suppose, how do I use the concept of predictive analytics? So, so if, I, if I want to design a new LCA and make sure that with whatever certainty, it will always meet my target requirements. So with this example, I'll just try to show you how you can do this. So uh, as, as this is like a general knowledge, like for any fatigue process, what you need is one is the, the fatigue life depends on the geometry of the part. So geometry means, yes, the different stress risers which are there, which give rise to KF, KT, the stress concentration factor, that means the local geometry. Then you have got the material fatigue properties. Then you have got the input loads. So the geometry, fatigue properties, and loads, these are the three things, three variables, which go, which, which, which go into any fatigue solver and output you can get a fatigue life contours and hotspots. So in this case, I've taken specifically a case where you are using a CAE durability analysis and, and trying to explore this complete LCA design for and find out where are the uncertainties which are present in the system. So these are the design inputs which go into the system and this is my actual fatigue simulation. I got my output. 
So initially what is done, see now, okay, now if you are able to add realistic variation from design and testing, so uh, the, the geometry variations, that means the fatigue stress concentration factor, so that comes from the various fillet radius which are present in the fillet, in, in, the, in the LCA. So in the part when you are doing an when you are doing a designer analysis, so at some critical spots, you no, know, the designer will specify what, what should be the range of my radii which are kept, or the dimensions of the notch which are there, because these are stress risers and these lead to fatigue. So in a design, you cannot strictly say my parameter has to be this only. There has to be a variation in the drawing. So because of that, let's say variation in that radius, there is a variation in fatigue stress concentration factor K. So, which is this input the input variation. Then the main material strength variation itself. So, the, again, the fatigue strength depends on whatever is the ultimate tensile strength of the part. So, my tensile strength itself varies. So, in the in the design drawing, you say that, yes, you procure the part with a minimum tensile strength of this. So, and then if you want to limit the cost of the part, maximum can't be very high. So, I have to say that minimum minimum should be this maximum you can limit to this. So I've got a distribution of the tensile strength of the material because of which you can find out what would be my variation of the material fatigue properties. And the third thing is track load variations. So people who are in RLDA know that nothing is repeatable. So the same road, same load, same vehicle, same driver, same window, the window of time, you do repeated tests, each test you, you get different loadings. So statistically, they may be significant to each other. But when you try to plot the load versus time, so example here, let's imagine that I, we have fitted a wheel force transducer to the, uh, to the uh, uh, and then we are trying to, we are gathering the different loads which are coming onto the wheel force, to the wheel force transducer is measuring the loads and the moments which are coming onto the, um, uh, part here. So they're having six loads, FX, FY, FZ, MX, MY, FZ. So I'm having load as a variable, material strength as the variable, my geometry variations are the KF variable. So then all these variations go into the fatigue solver, then I can carry out a probabilistic design analysis here. So first thing is what I do, so you know, I've got eight design variables. So out of which six are, uh, two are from geometry and six are from loading. One, six are from loading. So three forces, three moments. So geometry, strength. And so also the standard thumb rule says, so for each variation, for each design parameter, there has to be like 10 variations. So I've got eight, so 18 to 10, 80. So now uh, uh, through the machine learning software, we generate uh, through a concept known as uh, LHD, which is, which is nothing but uh, Latin hypercube design. So we generate an optimal DOE. So this gives a screenshot of the DOI. So there are 80 different points which are present here, which encompasses the all the variables, uh, which are the eight design variables. So I use this. So now I now I go back into the fatigue software and use these 80 runs of this to perform, or uh, to 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 uh, to perform to get 80 different values of uh, my fatigue line. So I've got 80 inputs and I got 80 responses now. All of this go into the machine learning algorithm. So wait, and then I'll form a predictive model from that. So now then I'll check. So the, this is the optimum LHT based DOE which are there, where all the load variations are taken, all the eight variables, design variables, variations have been taken. Here. So now out. So you can also vary what could be the input design variables, uh, data distribution. So inputs can be, see, some can be a normal distribution, some can be uh, like a uniform distribution. You can design the variables. So, and then as per that, you can do all this data sampling. So once I do this, so then I give it to the emulator and then in the first stage of design, so this is what my machine learning algorithm has built in. So what it has done is, it has given me a, a machine learning model. It means it has given me a durability model which can predict with an error of uh, less than 3%. So uh, you see here, it is now predicting lives with a uh, with a error of 3%. So 3% is good enough for me, error. So now what it means is, so now whatever emulator or the machine learning model which has been built here, so now 
if i am able to give any of these inputs other than this at any any combination of this at a design variables it is going to give me a fatigue life so which will differ from the actual simulation by only 3% so now now i got my machine learning model ready so now what you do so now further i go and then uh, this plot shows you that we have carried out 100000 simulation 1 lakh simulations using this machine learning model which would take only a few seconds to run because my entire now my durability flow is not running or my durability cae flow is not running only my machine learning model which mimics my flow is running so in a few seconds time so i get this plot which is based out of 100000 simulation so not just 8 or 80 or 100 i have done 100000 simulations 1 lakh simulations of various random parameters of all these eight design variables and then uh, 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 may, may, uh, uh, traverse to the entire design. So now on this, I'll be able to look at, see, there is a target repeats which have been given in the design target. So against the design, see, this x-axis is nothing but my hotspot lay for the design repeat. And the y-axis gives the frequency. And the area under the curve gives me what is the amount which is left out. So now now for, for this target of the repeats, I know that 95% of my samples meet this repeat, meet, meet this requirement. So that means still 5% of my LCA can fail. So that means I make 100, 100 cars, so five cars can still fail. So this is really bad. This is not good. So what do I do? I need to improve. It is How do I improve? So in this process of predictive analytics, along with the emulator, I also got a sensitivity analysis system. See, out of these eight parameters, so it has found that the strength of the component and the load, these are the two most sensitive parameters. Now, if I want to play with the, I want to get better life of the part, so I have to play only with these two parameters. So load variations, can we do something? We cannot do anything with the load variation because load comes from the road. So the way a person is driving, so we have gathered data with different drivers, different roads. We know what are the variations in load. So the only design parameter what I can vary, which will add value to this is the strength here. So now what I'll do, I'll just go back into my design. So now I'll redefine my strength. So my, st my material strength tolerance was, let us say, strength A1 to B1. So now A1, I'll move up. A1, I'll move to, let's A2. It will be A2 to B1. The minimum strength, I'll slightly move up. Now, the same 100,000 simulations I'll perform we can recalculate this entire uncertainty qualification without going back into simulation. So now you should remember that my trained model, it represents my actual simulation, CAE simulation, which would take a lot of time. So I don't go into that. So within a few seconds of time, so because my model is already trained, my predictive model is trained, so I just change the input material distribution, increase my minimum strength to a to A plus delta A, and then redo this, another 100,000 simulations within a few seconds. Now I'll get a different uncertainty quantification graph. Now I try to look at, where is my target? Now my target has improved. Now it is, it is now my, my design analysis tells me that 99% of the time I'm meeting my samples. My samples are meeting the target. This is good enough. This is definitely a workable solution. So this, this is the strength of a predictive analytics. So without, by, we, by doing a limited DOEs, which are intelligent DOEs, and using the state-of-art machine learning algorithms, so you build a predictive model, and you do all your design analytics on the predictive model. Thereby, you are saving time, and this can lead to optimization, saving time, and it can lead to a lot of design rethinking, redesigns. So without wasting much of time. So that was one example. And similar case, yes, uh, just a very small example here, a vehicle dynamics case study. So here, all the vehicle dynamics engineers you know, who are tuned in today, so they know they know that. So when they when they model a complete vehicle, so they try to model the entire vehicle using uh, many of the uh, MBD software with uh, with Adam's car being one of the MBD software which are used. Now imagine that this uh, this kind of a uh, vehicle problem comes to them where they have to uh, the, the the main 
the main power, uh, aspect of any uh, vehicle dynamics engineer is they have to freeze all the hard points. The hard points means the actual physical points which are there. So this sketch shows you the quarter vehicle of a vehicle. So I've got the wheel, uh, wheel, and I've got the upper arm and I've got the lower arm. So which are the what are the variations here? The variations are the length of the upper arm, the length of the lower arm, and the coordinates of this, which is measured by the angles which are here. So means so when you vary all these parameters when you are doing a design. So then when the and when you, this vehicle goes through a simulation, let's say it makes a movement on the road. So due to that, there is a toe angle change. So now let's imagine that this change in toe angle or the uh, the fixing of this or the optimization of this toe angle. So this is one of the main objectives of this vehicle dynamics engineer. So once my toe angle is optimized, so then based on that, you can fix many of the hard points which are present here. So generally, what do they do? So they do they go to uh, like a, a, um, um, an MBD, a machine uh, multi-body dynamic software like MSC, and then they, they do all the simulation. So if you want to study how exactly this behaves, because here, you no, know, this length can vary, the lower link length can vary, these angles can vary. So there are different design parameters. So what happens is, you, you do a standard set of DOEs, so through this machine learning algorithms, and then for only for these few DOEs, you go back into MSC Adams and then or your simulation software and generate the data. Then again, you generate this emulator, trained emulator. So once you generate the trained emulator, once the emulator is of sufficient accuracy, so then all your further analytics, like what in our previous durability case, you can do that. Then you can also optimize the points and then these optimized points, see all this you can do without going back. Once the emulator is built, you need not go back into the simulation at all. Because now your emulator, this will actually define what is happening within MSC Adams now in, or any of the other, in any of the simulation packages here. Just like the what you did in the previous case of durability. Once you do an optimization from this, you can go back into this just for a final verification. So these are the things. So these are the design variables. My length, arm, upper arm length can vary. Angle can vary. Lower arm can vary. Lower length angle can vary. So I've got four design variables with which to fix the hard point. So you generate like 25 into 4, 100 different DOEs. So go back, go back into your MBD and generate and you do an emulation here. So this emulation is a thing about building the predictive model. So once this is of sufficient accuracy, you go back and for let's say uh, 100,000 simulations. So this, this plot has been generated, uncertainty quantification plot. So imagine from the designer has a toe degree, maximum toe degree, he says that it should not go beyond three degree. Three uh, sorry, degree, sorry. toe angle. In between. Uh, you have sir, two or three minutes more, sir. To yeah, yeah, yes, 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 I'm done. Yes, yeah, yeah. Please, sir. yeah, please, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so now, now this train, train model has told me out, out of making 100,000 simulations using the emulator, that 97% of my models, they meet this maximum qualification limit of three degrees. So with this input, the designers can now freeze all the hard points here. So it means practically what we have done, so we have built a train model out of small number of DOEs with which I can practically do hundreds and thousands of simulations and quantify the entire uncertainty in the complete design space here. So that is the greatest advantage. Similarly, example, no, people are, who are doing a lot of engine tests. There are so many engine input variables which are there. You can vary this in a DOE. So build a model. So this model will now represent your entire engine. So for any change here, this will predict the model. This, this, is a, this is also a practical case what we have carried out. So this was one of the uh, latest emission engines where even HC, CO, NOx, PM, and even the PN, particle number. So they were also predicted here. Yeah. So ultimately, yes, this is the, this I just like want to recap. So this is what a good, predictive analytics which can come into your design space. This can add a lot of value 
and i feel that yes in as well as modern engineering is concerned no, this should be the way forward we should make use of all the kinds of enormous amount of data which we already have with us and with which we should be able to uh, do this kind of practices in and add value so this is a small brief about our company we are pune based so we have specialization in test data acquisition data analysis as well as consulting now with uq added so we work as product, products are concerned we work mainly with three three companies two are us based one is the uk based and we are um, these are all the different knowledge and services so the, thank you very much ladies and gentlemen for your very patient listening so thank you very much Thank you, sir, for the excellent presentation on predictive analytics for modern engineering. It was very relevant presentations. Now, for the second presentation of the webinar, I would like to welcome Mr. Surjit S. Gujral. Mr. Gujral has more than 15 years of experience in instrumentation and control field, working on high-speed data acquisition system, transducer, and application software for multiple industries and applications. At present, Mr. Gujral is working as a territory manager, West India at HPK India. He is handling the automotive sector with accounts like Tata Motors, Mahindra Trucks, Buses, Baja Auto, ARAI, Dana, Eton, and other automotive OEMs for various applications. He is also working on EV drivetrain to provide accurate solutions on applications like motor performance test, endurance test, efficiency map mapping, etc. We welcome you, sir. Mr. Gujarat uh, will be presenting on topic complete flow and test parameters, deriving meaningful outputs from data collected in AV. I now request Mr. Gujral to proceed with his presentation. So, so you guys can see my screen. Yes, sir. We can see your screen. Thank you. So I thank you, ICAT, for organizing this webinar, and I thank you that uh, we are just to be a part of this webinar. And uh, before I proceed. Uh, to all the panelists, speakers, ICAT team, organizers, I wish a very happy new year. And probably uh, it's a good platform to start with. So I'll begin, I'll, I'll bifurcate uh, my uh, presentation in three parts. So I'll start introducing what is HPK, and then I'll put forward with the, the, the topic, which is complete flow and test parameters deriving meaningful outputs from data collected in electric vehicles so which so i kindly keep, uh, sorry to interrupt in between sir kindly keep uh, the presentation moved on sir is it uh, you you guys can't see my uh, on the presentation mode yes sir we cannot see on presentation mode okay i just sit sick i'll just try again Can you see this on the presentation mode now? Yes, sir, we can see it now, yeah. Okay. So I begin, uh, so HBK is basically uh, it's an amalgamation of two powerhouses, HBM and BNK. We are based out of Darmstadt and the HBK headquarters are in UK. So I'm sure probably in the instrumentation domain, People would have definitely well aware about these names called Brule and Care and HPM. Uh, the business started somewhere around, I think this is a 70, 75 years old company. And uh, we are probably domain expert in noise and vibrations, in reliability, in endurance testing, in machine mappings, probably this 
or as I said, a 70, 70 years or 70 plus years of experience which comes through with these two companies. And uh, the BNK, as I said, is again a part where NVH sound and vibration comes into picture and for HBM, reliability, durability, efficiency, mapping, wing, all this is into what we bring in the domain expertise. And we also would like to just add that HBM is probably pioneer in time domain and BNK part of that is the frequency domain pioneering into this. And our goal, which is today we are probably the world's number one provider for precision instrumentation uh, for processing and control applications. And we also are delivering reliable, durable, accurate data for whatever tests we are probably conducting. And the tomorrow what we have a future, what we say is a unified platform where all the customers and the users, they can come across and have the simulation and the real data to be compared. An effective hub where all the test models can be created and obviously an ecosystem where any of the third party systems can integrate and work on. Uh, so HBK is a powerhouse where we are currently serving around 35,000 customers globally with around 3,000 employees again globally working and as I said innovation of some roughly 75 years. Global scale with local presence so we are almost available everywhere in the world. And in India, we are probably headquartered in Chennai and I am based out of Pune. We also have our uh, engineers in uh, North, which is in uh, Delhi and down South, as I said, headquarters in Chennai. Also we have engineer in Karnataka. So this is literally on the, the Indian team. HBK uh, comes under uh, an umbrella company called Spectris. Spectris is a London stock exchange listed company with an operating profit in 2019, roughly around 293 million. Uh, moving further, so what is the expectation from HBK, the customers expect, and uh, what is the future, what we're trying to convey through the HBK solutions? So the HBK brings in a complete solution house for sensors, data acquisition, data management, analysis software, simulation softwares, and this is what the customer requires from us is, the sensors should be really accurate, reliable, and easy to configure. Again, on the DAQ part, they need a flexible modular system where they should not really struggle by connecting sensors. They can connect any sensor to the system. On the data management part, of course, they want interoperability well. They can probably work out with different softwares, which can work on different, different, again, further third-party softwares. The data uh, format should be something universal in any way which is acceptable to any of the analysis software uh, again on the analysis part people and the customer wants it should be easy to use feature rich the gui should be very simple they should really not struggle in getting that sort of understanding how to work out and the last definitely the simulation that should be flexible flexible accurate to the real world and this is where we say the underlying trend is people want the sensor to be intelligent they can probably understand and work out easily. They should not really struggle into connecting them, working out how they need to be connected and all. It should be easy to work out. And I'm sure probably you guys would agree that when we talk about instrumentation, we have to have a mindset where we come across it, it's going to be quite tough. But at the other end from HBM, we try to make it very simpler, easier, and the people should really enjoy working with the sensors and the DAQ systems. We connect the physical measurement with this digital simulation. So probably before starting a prototype, of course, we have the simulation modeling, the analysis part, and then we probably try to validate that by creating a prototype. And it's a, it's a complete cycle where we, when we validate, we again try to go and work out on the simulation. So this is that the HBM brings out one of the USP that we connect the physical measurements and the digital simulations through our solutions. And as a product physics expert, we are probably serving the three domains, which is the mechanical part, where we have further subdomains, we measure strain, vibration, load, torque, pressure, durability. And on the NVH part, we measure noise, vibration, sound power, sound quality, complete acoustics into this, and the electrical part for where we are today. 
the image of voltages, current, speed, torque, efficiency mapping, inverter mapping. So all of those things we probably cover through the electrical domain, which brings our solutions. So coming to the part of the presentation where we talk about complete fluent test parameters. So before we say to understand the data, we have to have a system which can get us the accurate data. And in the electrical drives or the electrical segment, which is currently right now booming in all across globe. In India, I think uh, we are sure we people are trying to understand how to work effectively and how to have a understandable data, uh, measurable data related to the EVs, related to the engine, uh, the motors, the inverters, and all such uh, batteries and all which is involved in this. So you can see some various examples and some various applications in which uh, the electrification has been happening up. We know about the electric cars, we know electric two wheelers, right now probably in and railways working on high speed trains, metro organizations working on high speed metros where they have to work effectively and have an efficient engine, sufficient motors working into that. Nonetheless, it's not too far. The testings are going on for an electric drive on a aeroplane where Airbus is actually testing it. Uh, we proudly say on HVM solutions. Uh, electric ship motors, wind generators, all this are the certain applications where we can probably see the future of electrification. Now to understand electric drive train, what exactly are the components which are there in the electric drive train? You have a power source, you have an inverter, you have a machine, and further which is coupled with the transmission. So the power source, of course, when you talk about a vehicle scenario, we have a battery which gives us a DC input and goes to the inverter. The inverter further is converting the DC into AC, which is given to a machine, and further the machine is coupled with the shaft of the transmission. Now, what are the things we probably are, or we can, try to improve to make this drive efficient. We need to have a improved inverter or better inverter where we need to do the measurements to understand what things can make it best. And of course, on the machine part, how and what sort of machines we should be probably connecting. So there are a lot of motors, PMSM, induction motors, DC motors, all those motors, how they can be connected and to work out how efficiently they can be matched with the inverter, which is my other point we say inverter, uh, the machine matching and of course the drive strategy so you would have heard about this term called uh, keeping the cars or vehicles in sport mode economy mode probably a performance mode so this is something where we call it as in our terminology called drive strategy now what are the daq requirements when we consider these components of a drive train at the power source, of course, uh, we want to measure voltage, current, and ultimately the VI gets at the electrical power for the battery. At the inverter output, we try to measure three phase or six phase or n phase voltages. Similarly, n phase currents, CAN commands, for which is communicating the, the inverter how it is switching. Then ultimately, we calculate the electrical power at the inverter out. And at the machine end, we couple the machine where it is connected to the transmission shaft with a torque sensor, and we try to measure torque, speed, angle, winding temperature. Sometimes people even want to measure vibrations, noise, to want to understand how my vehicle is. Is it quite efficient? Is it comfortable? So this is something which they want to understand. Now, all this derives us to the efficiency of the inverter, the efficiency of the machine, and ultimately, the drive efficiency. Now, why are we trying to test it, measure it? So the major part is whatever we are trying to convey and understand the data should be accurate. And the process where this is involved while you're measuring should be productive. It should not waste a lot of time or we should not struggle with the data. And of course, whatever conclusions we reach that data, whatever we see, should be auditable. So if any third party, or in fact, any of the team wants to understand that whatever data has been received by the system, is it where we can ask it is auditable or not? So moving further on that part, 
the classical way or i would say the old technique what people have been following up to measure the drive drain part is we add the power source try to measure the voltages and current using multimeters where v and i are measured at the inverter end since it's like a ac coming into picture so we have to understand what are the power fluctuations to so be use a power analyzer and of course we use a oscilloscope to understand the trace and at the machine end as i said we use a torque sensor so we connect our data acquisition to measure all the parameters speed torque winding temperature and further other things so i've just mentioned the challenges what it brings when we use these three different or four different systems to understand so the challenges is the conventional power analyzers deliver very few calculations and are really not reliable under the dynamic load chain situation so understand from this aspect the analyzers or the power analyzers which we have seen in our test labs in colleges and research areas they were primarily manufactured to have the measurements for the household appliances for the household things which are coming which are working at a fixed frequency 50 hertz and in a vehicle the scenario is totally different which is not where we have a fixed frequency it's dynamic it's transient in nature so that's why we say that uh, these systems probably have a very limited channels count and they really are not reliable under dynamic load chain situations and of course when we have three four systems running in they all have a different storage format different data interpretation so which is a difficult part to synchronize everything and of course no raw data verification for analysis so before i just explain when we say no raw data analysis we i want to explain this user comment which is he or the users have conveyed sometimes we measure efficiency larger than one we can't believe that but we can't analyze as further we have no raw data for verification so when i say this time it's something like this so you have a battery pack which is connected to inverter further which is connected to a motor on a torque sensor so you can see all three three or four instruments are connected now we these that's like a black box to us you can grab that data see something coming on the screen why how when you have no idea you just can note down and if somebody really wants to have a reverification not possible so definitely in this domain as an ev part you have to have an accurate system and why we need to have an accurate system specifically for evs so i'll just put up this statement uh if i talk about ic engines they are probably comes under the efficiency range of around 35 to 40 percent efficient the ic engines whereas the motors if i talk about they come under the efficiency range of around 95 to 98 percent now if i say if i have an error percentage of around like plus minus three percent or plus minus five percent so on an engine aspect if you just have this plus minus three or five percent that will add probably if i take like roughly 35 to 40 percent like 45 to 35 range of domain but if i take this scenario to the motor aspect if i say 98 percent or 95 percent with the plus minus so it goes beyond 100 percent and that's not possible and generally if you go with this data to your bosses that my machine or my drive is more than 100 percent efficient so you'll really judge your techniques to understand whether the accuracy whatever he's saying is it accurate or not so that's what i think the present demands comes into the market where all the ev designers r and d's analysts they want to have such a system where they can probably connect all the channels into one system whether it is mechanical whether it's electrical or whether it's digital bus everything should be connected in one system the system should be capable to have high speed acquisition and storing the data without any phase shifts in the same system where you should not really struggle with three four different systems giving three four different data and you're really struggling with that and the results as i said of course which is the most important should be verified reliable accurate and you can trust on it and it should not act like a black box to you where you if you are using any formula you can understand why and how this formula is behaving 
and what best I can do if if something is not perfect into this. You can edit those things. And of course, where it should not be a system which should just say that it should work with only my sensor, my system, and my software. It should be an open platform where you can connect anything, everything, and get the most out of it. So, of course, now when I talk about uh, the drive train, how we measure current. So, I'm sure you would have seen the electrical engineers would have seen the currents to be measured. So, generally, people use the clamps, the CTs, sometimes they use the Hall effect sensors or Rogowski coils. So, these are the methods, but generally, to have high accurate data, we suggest to go with the CTs. And of course, when we talk about easy to install, we go with clamps. They are really easy to install. You just have to press this knob and it gets over the cable and you can get the data. But as I said, they are low in accuracy. So it depends again on the application, what sort of uh, application we're trying to utilize to measure current. And when I talk about voltages, there are various ways to measure voltages depending upon the range. So with HBM, of course, we have a system which can have a direct 1.5 kV voltage input. And beyond that, we can have those voltage probes, which can probably provide you the isolation and the voltage input to the system. And of course, I think this is where we bring our uh, expertise into the mechanical part. Talk sensors, so HBM has the world's highest accuracy talk sensor, the T12 HP. And uh, this is, again, why I'm uh, probably saying the same accuracy. This is required definitely for a EV to have the most reliable and accurate data. You cannot play with instruments which are having low accuracies. And there is a note which we I always like to convey. For a meaningful efficiency calculation, of course, in a EV or in an EV rig, in a vehicle, we our ultimate motto is to have an efficient system. So to have a meaningful efficiency calculation, the mechanical power should be calculated over the same cycle as the mechanical power. It should not happen that the mechanical, that the electrical power has been given as input, and we don't know the moment we're trying to, or if there is a change in the voltage and the current, how the drive is behaving. So it should not happen like this. It should be perfectly synchronized data to be seen, and we can see how they are affecting on the same cycle. So typically, from the HBM perspective, if I talk about, we have a system which can be connected to all these inputs, whether it comes from the power source, the inverter out, the machine out, and it connects to the automation system and a PC where you can sit in the control area. And this is where you connect the, the item under test, uh, the load system, and the things are connected. And the same challenges what we had are now the advantages over here. So you can have power calculations plus user formats, which is editable. You can have the synchronization of all the data streaming into one system, continuous recording, first snapshot, motor mapping, verification analysis. You can have the advanced analysis, which is the post part when we have the accurate data with us. You can probably the analysis part comes into space vector, DQ0, loss mapping, whether it's copper losses, iron losses, tear gap torque, torque ripple, all such parameters related to the analysis can be well performed over the system. So moving further, this is how the entire setup looks like, where you have your battery pack, you have inverter, you have your motor, all connected to one system. And further, as I said, if the user wants, they can add uh, more sensors to this. Like you can see a microphone connected here. You can put an accelerometer. You can connect strain gauges. You can connect thermocouples. You can connect four sensors, displacement sensors. All this can be connected and all streaming in a synchronized way. The biggest challenge, probably you would also agree with this, is the electrical part is too dynamic compared to the mechanical part. And to synchronize all these things in a perfect way, you really require a system which can work effectively with accurate data. So this is something when I talk about, you have the configurable system, you have a card which is quite accurate in terms of the industry standard available in the market, one of the best accuracy. It, and then again, we talk about the talk sensor, the world's highest accuracy talk sensor, and of course, the optional systems to connect the mechanical inputs related to the testing. 
so now understanding the meaningful data part we get the system we get the instrument which is giving or connected to the sensors getting the data to be synchronized sorry, uh, streamlined. sorry to interrupt you in between uh, yeah. you have 10 more minutes to go for the presentation so i quickly want you to just compile the presentation in 10 minutes thank you yeah you said you said 10 minutes of yes sir 10 minutes more yeah thank you yeah so moving further now since we have the streamlined data coming into picture uh you know as i said we have these three components as the power source the inverter out and the motor out so of course best or the software should be something where you can be flexible modular you can create your own guis you can create your own mapping and all and of course when we talk talk about uh, six phase nine phase machines hybrid machines you should not really struggle with the, the software the system should be quite good enough that we can connect or we can create and modulize and flexible things to have everything into one shot we should not really struggle and worry about how to probably work out when i have a further n phase or nine phase motors or machines with us so this is this is again another aspect adding to it i have a typical hybrid setup where my battery pack where my inverter and my motor are connected and further again this is going back to the battery pack so this is a hybrid model or we see it as a motor generator configuration where you can get the input and also understand how the input when it is going back in charging the battery how efficient is that so all such challenging things which are really in demand are can be done easily over this system uh, we can probably play with the things you can have an analyzer you can have an oscilloscope you can have more meters a complete screen with a power laser you can have the 50 so all these things can be easily done yeah this is the most important i would say uh, people should have a, a real understanding on this slide what i'm just presenting a uh, couple of slides back when i was just saying we should have the electrical power and the mechanical power on the same cycle the electrical cycle and the mechanical cycle so if you see this typical picture the first the green red the green hair shows the input voltage and the red hair shows the input current similarly at the inverter out i have my three line currents coming out from the inverter and my three line voltages coming out from the inverter here my green which is this face is my rpm and red is my torque so when i say same cycle if you see the moment i am changing my torque how synchronized i can see that my demand of current from the battery as well as the inverter has been changing similarly on this aspect you see the moment i change my torque i go from low to high and the demand of current is changing so this is something which is unique and i would say you would not able to in the market till this time we have nothing such we can which can perform the synchronization of the electrical and the mechanical data where the control algorithm guys analyst guys they can create their ecus they can create their algorithms they can create their drive strategies to understand that how the demand of torque and the demand of current can be matched and further if the same data what you see is raw in nature so this is again what is the usp comes with uh, or the demand comes with the ev part is you can save that entire raw data you should not just have some data with you for some cycles or for some samples the entire raw data should be saved and we can further analyze it so if i talk about analysis you can have those per sample measurement and again the most important part when i was conveying you that the conventional analyzers were probably made for household appliances for household supplies which works at 50 hertz so if you see here this is a typical setup where my green trace is my current and my red trace is my cycle trace so it's trying to understand how the cycle is probably moving in so the conventional analyzer they work on a technology called pll which is probably known as phase lock loop and they lock the phase for a certain frequency and they try to detect the cycle which is really not good for cycles which are dynamic in nature 
so we have to have such an instrument such a system which can probably work on dynamic cycles you can see like initially the frequency is low and then it goes higher so a dynamic in nature where we talk about and this is something really important to understand the accuracy of the input data what we are performing if you have minor mistakes into that it your entire test goes haywire you probably cannot even achieve I means when i say achieve you can't even believe that what changes you can create a small uh, error into your measurements and now as i said it's not like a black box it's a system where you have those formulas you can see how the derivations of any electrical or the mechanical things comes into picture these are editable you can copy and create your own formulas and i lead to this which is the most engineers would look ahead and say yes i really want to see this slide uh the stop part what you see is a mix of uh, torque where my torque is red in color my mechanical power which is blue and my rpm which is black here this second is my two power and apparent power and my third is motor efficiency so yes to your surprise we measure efficiency traces over time and if you see here the moment my torque and rpm is varying i'm varying my torque and rpm how the efficiency of the entire drive is varying so this is something unique which you can understand and people expect from the systems currently running that it should behave something where if i change my torque and rpm how the efficiency is changing which leads to the efficiency plots i just skip, skip over and probably lead to the efficiency plot so this is when we call it as an efficiency plot if you closely monitor this plot this is my torque on y and speed on x and if you see that uh, typically at 25 newton meter of torque and roughly at around 2000 to 4500 meter of uh, 4500 rpm i have my maximum zone or I, i would say the efficient zone of my drive so this is something which is in demand and with hbm the best part is the entire efficiency plot can be probably created in some seconds this is live you can have your set points you just throw and trigger your set points where the if you see the right part the table is created and parallelly the entire efficiency plot plot is created so this is something very unique which we bring in you and if i go back to further more slides where we are talking about accuracy productivity and auditability so this is called a productivity where you're not wasting your time and the auditability part when the entire data is saved with me the entire raw data which is here with me can be given to probably analysis team testing team the team who is working on the ecu part the team who is working on the algorithms part can be shared they all can re verify understand and see how in line the mechanical and the electrical systems are behaving since being a one system this is the usp that you really need, don't need to struggle with so many other systems so many other monitors so many other data synchronization things to be happening all happening at one place and this is something when we talk about that uh, if you see probably i just want to uh, i'll take a couple of few minutes on this part uh, this red is my torque and my green is my rpm here so you can see the moment my torque i'm trying to come down and my rpm is going to increase so this typically looks like going down a hill where i was initially riding up a hill but then later i'm going down a hill so how my line currents and my line voltages they probably are behaving and uh, with the demand of torque and rpm so this is something where we would like to convey that with such systems you save a lot of time you can easily come to some conclusions related to the uh, the efficiency related to the loss losses and uh, which saves and gives us reliable data so this is something again we are running this machines at very high sampling rate and of course if you want to zoom out you can have a sample level understanding on this part and probably with this i'll just convey that uh, we have certain links and topics which are online on youtube you can just put hbm in drive on the youtube we can probably scroll hbm.com where we have certain topics which are in demand right now 
have a look onto those i think uh, people would be really interested in vehicle electric power measurements so you have this links with us we have the power lenses for e, e machines for six phases complex drives with multiple machines like hybrid machines all running into picture so you can have a look onto these links and of course hbm brings a solution there which is probably we have planned and such solution days are probably coming up so in 2022 in this january on 20th january we are putting up a solution there which is majorly focusing on the structural testing uh, related to bridges related to probably uh, any structure which is rich which requires condition monitoring so people like uh, railways and all they really want to understand the bridge life and all and i think my other speaker which was just speaking over uh, the reliability part so this is something where we bring in the equipment instrumentation and we have the industry guys like from iit madras cbri people that being a part of the solution day and we'll be sharing their thoughts on this so with this uh, it brings end to my presentation and people have any questions do let me know thank you Thank you, sir, for the excellent presentation and relevant presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. For the third presentation of the webinar, I would like to welcome Mr. Girish Chavan. Mr. Chavan has completed Liability Engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. He has more than of nine years of professional experience. He was earlier working as a senior manager in testing at Photon Motors from May 2012 to May 2013. Later, he started working as a divisional manager, RLDA Durability, Dynamics, and VH at Force Motor Limited in Pune from May 2013 to April 2021. At present, Mr. Chavan is working as a program manager at Tata Consultancy Service in Chennai. He is an expert in NVH, instrumentation, product development through validation, QFD for new product introduction, benchmarking for design input documents, new product target setting for life expectancy, design failure mode and effect analysis, engineering, Kaizen and automotive. He also has an experience in automotive company in the domain of testing and measurement of RLD and NVH Ex, uh, experimental studies. We welcome you, sir. Mr. Chavan will be presenting on topic durability and reliability testing method, key indicators of product validation and verification. I now request Mr. Chavan to proceed for his presentation. Sir.
So please unmute, unmute yourself. So we can uh, see the presentation, but the voice is not coming. So we cannot see your video also. Yeah, I think there is some technical issues. So we will be proceeding with the next presentation. We will take a Greece presentation afterwards. For the fourth presentation, uh, it's a just a third presentation. Uh, I would like to welcome Mr. Khalid Hassan. Mr. Khalid Hassan has completed BTEC in Mechanical Engineering from Pondicherry Engineering College in 2006. He had also completed MS in Manufacturing Management from Wits Pilani in 2013. He has an overall 15.6 years of professional experience. He was earlier working as an assistant manager in manufacturing engineering at Tractors and Farm Equipment Limited from 2006 to 2011. He was also working in manufacturing engineering as a deputy manager at Ashok Deer from 2011 to 2015. Later to which he was working as manager in machine shop quality at Ashok Leyland Foundry Division from 2016 to 2018. At present, Mr. Khalid Hassan is working as a senior manager in manufacturing quality engineering testing at Dusan Bobcat. He is also responsible for conducting various projects at Dusan's Bobcat, such as B900 Stage 4 AL performance test, durability test, global BHL P760 Tier 3 high altitude validation, global BHL B760 Tier 3 performance test, durability test. DVAT test for all new products, road homologation certification, BHL, SSL, MEX, durability issues action, implementation and validation, customer feedback, action implementation and validation. His career also summary also include for manufacturing engineering, new product introduction, productivity improvement, capacity expansion, layout modification, Six Sigma project, lean manufacturing. 
for manufacturing quality, new product introduction, incoming quality, quality gates, final inspection, pre-delivery inspection, field warranties, and field failures. For engineering testing, new product performance test, durability test, DVET test, and customer feedback. We welcome you, sir. Mr. Thank Kali Dhashan, yeah, Mr. Kali Dhashan will be presenting on topic HVAC performance validation in construction equipment vehicle. I now request Mr. Kali Dhasan to proceed with his presentation, sir. Thank you for your brief introduction. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible, my pleasure. Yeah, uh, is my screen is visible to everyone? Yeah, sir, your screen is visible. Okay, okay. Uh, good morning all and uh, wish you all a happy new year. And I thank ICAT for providing me an opportunity to present on the uh, uh, HVAC performance validation in construction equipment vehicle. So agenda for the today's uh, webinar is on introduction about the uh, Dozan Bobcat India Limited and uh, HVAC, uh, a brief introduction about the HVAC and the HVAC system overview and the uh, HVAC system in the DBI in construction equipment vehicle and the HVAC performance validation and a case study. So uh, on brief about the uh, Dozan Bobcat India Limited, it is a brownfield project. The plant is located in Gumudi Pundi, Chennai, and it has a uh, total area of 48.9 acres in which 21 acres is of uh, the factory is being uh, in the plant. And we manufacture the products of backhoe loaders for the uh, domestic as well as the uh, global market. And we import the uh, uh, skid steer loader and the excavators from uh, uh, from uh, Dozan, and then we sell it in the domestic market of India. So these are the major projects which we manufacture and cater to uh, Indian domestic market as well as to the global markets. So this is about the uh, detail about the Dozan Bobcat India Limited. Here I take care of the new product testing and validation and the durability testing. So HVAC introduction, the primary purpose of an air conditioning system is to provide an operator comfort by removing the heat and humidity from the operator's environment. And the basic methodology of air conditioning system is to compress the refrigerant to a high pressure in which the compressor compresses and increases the temperature due to compression process and allows the energy to be removed from the system from the cooling package airflow and allow the high pressure refrigerant to quickly expand. And the basic components for the air conditioning system is we require a compressor, condenser, receiver, driver, thermal expansion wall, and the evaporator, blower, freeze protection switch, low high pressure switch, high low combination pressure, refrigerant hoses, air filters, and drains. So on next slides, we can see the functioning and the how, the, how it works, the HVAC system. So this is the NetSwag system overview in which it has a compressor, condenser, receiver, blower, and a thermal expansion wall and an evaporator. It can, the process takes place in a four process. So first one is the compression takes place in the compressor. The refrigerant is enters through the compressor and the warm low pressure gas is converted to a high pressure gas in which the energy is added to the system by the compressor. And the high pressure gas enters the condenser in which a process of condensation takes place inside the condenser the hot high pressure gas is converted to a hot high pressure liquid energy is removed from the system from the condenser and next the hot high pressure liquid goes to an receiver or dryer in which it filters the mist from the mist and the moisture from the uh, liquid which is going through the thermal expansion wall the next process which takes place is the expansion process which takes in the thermal expansion wall. So in which the hot high pressure liquid which comes out from the reservoir dryer in which it converts to a cold low pressure mixture in which occurs in the thermal expansion wall. Next is the evaporation which takes place in, in the evaporator. The cold low pressure mixture comes from the thermal expansion wall, goes to the evaporator and then converts to a low, cool low pressure gas. So energy is added to the system by the evaporator. So likewise, the system continues as a cycle. This is an HVAC system overview of how it functions. 
So this is the HVAC system is in the DBN plant, DBN construction equipment vehicle. So in which if you see the driver face or the front windshield and on the rear side, the yellow points which has been shown as the ducts, which has been phased on the bottom ducts and this is the front console duct and the B pillar duct and uh, the rear window ducts and in which the red points are the louvers which has been placed for the airflow. As we have seen the schematic of the HVAC, it is uh, shown in the compressor is fitted to the engine in which the compressor the refrigerant is filled with in the compressor and from it goes to the condenser and from condenser it goes to the receiver unit and from re receiver unit to the thermal expansion unit and then it goes to the HVAC unit. So this is then schematic representation in the construction vehicle equipment for uh, the HVAC in which uh, the louvers and the, and the ducts are being fixed. So for our construction equipment, this is the first time which we have implemented the uh, HVAC system for the entire domestic and the, uh, the export models. So this is the first time we are working on the HVAC system for our uh, construction equipment. So we have validated our HVAC system as per ISO 10263. So the design and uh, the HVAC system has been done by the Bergstrom. And the following points which we have verified before we are validating this as per ISO 263, whether it is confirming to our specifications. First, we have measured the air velocity on the condenser core. Next, we have measured the airflow on all the louvers which are fixed on the uh, ducts and the pillars. And we have measured the cap pressurization in order to know that whether any leakage in the system is there to, uh, to withstand the, uh, uh, the cooling capacity. And next, the smoke test has been conducted to seal all the leakages and the charge optimization to know the what is the optimal charge level which is required to uh, for the compressor for the uh, for the cool down test and then the ac or cool down test has been conducted and the heater test and the defrost test so these are the tests are as per iso2 as 10263 to confirm that the hvac validation is performing as per the standard and meets the criteria so since it is the new product and the new new type which we are implementing. So we wanted to validate uh, before we uh, we implement. So first we have measured the air velocity and the condenser core, which is uh, placed near to the cooling package. We have uh, divided into an equal uh, equal area and then we have measured the airflow on the condenser at different RPMs at idle RPM and throttle RPM and then at the maximum RPM with the help of anemometer and we have measured at different positions and then we have observed that the average flow is very good and the condenser point of uh, thing and usually it is to be a five to seven meter per second so it is more than five me five meters per second in all the rpms so it has as a healthy condenser core so next we have measured on the airflow on all the louvers to ensure that the airflow is good on all the louvers to make sure that the cooling uh, the cooling efficiency is improved in all the louvers so in order that we have measured the airflow in all the points of the louvers and then we have observed that normally for a good airflow for all the louvers should be a, a, a more than four meters per second in which we have found that in the front console we have observed the airflow is very less when compared to the uh, standard so this was the one of the observation which we have observed during the airflow measurement of the louvers and one more point is that we have observed the voltage which is required to throw the air from the uh, with the help of the blower is very less which is 12.5 uh, volt where only the acid condition which we have received during the measurement so we have ensured one of the point is that we need to improve on the voltage from 12.5 to 13.8 volt and then next we need to improve the airflow on the louvers this was the first point which we have observed during our validation as per the standard so based upon the inputs on the airflow, which is very less to require to do the cool down test, then we have uh, had a brainstorming with the uh, our design team along with the Bergstrom team. And then we have analyzed that the duct, whatever is being designed for throw the airflow, the profile is not sufficient to throw the adequate airflow. And then the all the duct has been reworked internally. And then to know that whether we get the required airflow for the help of modifying this duct. So the inner diameter which was uh, uh, existing was 48 mm has been reworked to 75 mm and the air entry has been uh, increased and the bottom duct uh, which goes to the uh, uh, 
uh, HVAC unit also the entry level air entry level point also has been increased and the B pillars on the both the ducts as also the diameter also has been increased from 48 mm to 75 mm and next in the B pillar the tapper entry has been provided to have a better airflow so these are the ducts has been modified and again we have done the airflow test on the uh, all the ducts uh, and the uh, louvers and then we have observed that the airflow has increased and then we have improved the blower uh, voltage also from 12.5 to 13.4 by improving the harness so we have implemented with the new harness and the new reworked ducts has been assembled in the vehicle and again we have found that the airflow was pretty good to uh, conduct the cool down test so this was the analysis which we have taken from the after validating the airflow and next we have done the cap pressurization test after uh, knowing that the airflow is sufficient to conduct the cooldown test we wanted to know that whether any leakage is there inside the cab to withstand uh, the uh, cooling efficiency inside the cabin so if there is any leakage then the the temperature will not be maintained inside the cabin so for a healthy cabin we require uh, 50 pascal to be maintained at an 100 meter cube per hour so the air will be blowed at a certain volume and then uh, the, it will be uh, withhold for uh, 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 five minutes at an interval of uh, different intervals and then it will be monitored what is the pascal has been maintained so at that time when we have started the trials we have found that only 14.7 pascal was maintained and then we have done a smoke test and we have observed in all the door joints and the bottom of the ducts there was a leakage of uh, smoke was there so air leakage was there has been observed so in order to arrest the leakages so we have uh, sealed of the cabin uh, we have improved the sealing of the doors and the windows and the points wherever the uh, the openings were there has been arrested with uh, uh, with uh, with the insulations so that we have arrested the uh, leakage and then we have achieved the 50 pascal at 100 meter cube per hour so this was the next improvement which we have done to, in order to uh, arrest the leakage in order to withstand the cooling efficiency inside the cabin so once the air air flow in the louvers as well as the uh, the leakage in the cabin has been arrested we have went for an uh, charge optimization which is required to conduct the ac or cool down test so we have fixed the uh, high and low pressure side of the charging manifold and the compressor and then measured the uh, the pressure at the uh, compressor and then vacuum has been generated and to ensure that any leakage in the system the condenser or in the hoses or a thermal unit expansion wall to fill with then optimal charge what is required for doing the uh, pull down test so we have uh, vacuumized the system and then we have found no leakage was there and then we have uh, filled the gas the refrigerant in the compressor uh, for, for first from 500 gram in a step of 50 gram and then achieved a uh, value of 1500 gram of gas has been filled in the compressor so with the with all the improvements of uh, improvement in the louvers and the uh, uh, smoke by arresting the leakages in the cabin and then we have optimized the charge of uh, 1500 grams of refrigerant in the uh, uh, in the compressor we have started the test of ac cool down test with the instrumentation to measure all the parameters during the test so to measure the temperature of the louvers the air temperature of all the louvers which has been fixed with the thermocouples and then as per the iso standard uh, the iso mankin points uh, like uh, in foot lhrh and the hip of lhrh and the hand chest and the nose uh, all the points has been thermocouple has been fixed with iso mankin to make sure that the airflow and, and the temperature has been monitored uh, to know that whether it is uh, the the required cooling is attained or not to have a basic data we have uh, added all the instrumentation and also on the condensers also what is the temperature of the heat is being dissipated also has been uh, installed and the refrigerant whatever has been uh, insert has been given through the compressor also we have measured the in and out temperature of the compressor and the condenser and the uh, thermal expansion wall in and out temperature also being uh, instrumented and then now everything has been tracked to while doing the test in order to know that if any uh, issues happens to analyze on the data we have captured all this data on all the points the instrumentation has been done
And next, we have uh, conducted the cool down test with all the points, and then we have found that the lower temperature was very high in some of the points. And we have analyzed that uh, the heat pickup is more uh, at the bottom of the duct and the roof and the headliner. So this was the one point which we have observed. And then the ISO, as I've explained, that ISO uh, temperature thermocouples has been fixed to as per the ISO standard at certain points to monitor. And then we have observed there was a drop in the temperature during the cool, cool down test. So, but uh, the, uh, the uh, required uh, temperature of delta 11 as per the standard is not uh, reached. So, uh, we have observed that the heat pickup was there. So, in order to address that, we have added a thermal insulation in the front of the, uh, the console. So, in order, because in front of the console, we have an engine, so heat pickup will be more from the engine. So, we have planned to install a uh, uh, thermal insulation as well as on the uh, roof, entire roof, the thermal insulation has been added and on the uh, bottom duct also, it has been entirely sealed in order to avoid the, uh, to pick up of the heat from the, uh, all the area. So this was the another improvement which has been done. And then again, we have uh, measured the cool down test uh, with, uh, uh, we have found that the lower temperature when compared to before and after, we have soaked it for an hour and then we have measured it we have found that uh, the uh, the temperature has dropped down and we had opportunity for still some of the points at the front console duct to be improved to reduce the temperature. But apart from that, all the other temperature has reduced with the uh, help of the duct modification and the insulations has been added and arresting the uh, leakages. So we have achieved the required temperature. And uh, the cool down test ISO mankin also, we have achieved the temperature from 47 degree to 20 degree in a 30 minutes time frame. So this was the trials which we have validated with the new HVAC unit in our uh, uh, first time in our plant as per the ISO standard. With all these improvements, we have uh, developed the SOP parts and then implemented in the machine. In order to validate the validation, whatever we have done with the uh, uh, here in our plant, uh, the, it certifies as per the ISO standard in a closed chamber. So we are conducted the same test in the ICAT in a closed chamber. The, similarly, we have done the cap pressurization test uh, by uh, uh, giving airflow of uh, 128 uh, meter cube per hour. We have achieved a 49 Pascal, which is proves that it was a healthy cabin. With all the improvements, whatever we have initiated with the SOP parts, we have uh, validated and it has passed the cap pressurization test. And we have measured the airflow in all the louvers, and then we have found that uh, we have a sufficient airflow, which was uh, in all the vents, it was uh, good. So we have ensured that the cap pressurization and the uh, airflow is very good in all the points. And next, we have uh, done the charge optimization in a, co in a closed chamber at an ambient of uh, 43 degree and the relative humidity of 40 percent. So we have choked, we have soaked in the chamber for one hour. And then we have uh, measured the uh, low and uh, high and low pressure of the, uh, the, the compressor. And after choking, and once it reaches the ambient temperature, again, we have filled the 500 grams of, uh, in a step of 50 grams. And then we have went up to 1,100 grams to check the subcooling. So we have optimized the charge as 1,400. Whereas in factory, when we have done the validation, it was uh, not in a closed chamber, so it was, uh, it was finalized as 1,500 gram for the efficient cooling. Now, with a uh, setup in a closed chamber, we have found that 1,400 gram was the optimal charge which is required for the compressor. So next on the cool down test, so with the optimized charge of 1,400 gram, we have uh, we have we have soaked the vehicle in a closed chamber, and then we have conducted we have at an ambient of 39 degree once it reached the 39 degree with a relative humidity of 40 percent of uh, RH. So we have started on the engine with the 1600 RPM and the no solar load has been provided. And we have switched on the AC for one hour and then we have monitored. There was a drop of uh, in 30 minutes, it dropped from 39 degree to 25.83 degree. So as per standard, uh, delta should be of uh, 11 degree. So we have reached 12 degree in 30 minutes and in 60 minutes, we have reached a delta of 14 degree. So we had a good cooling efficiency inside the cabin with all the improvements which we have taken place. And it has passed the criteria of ISO 10263. So next we have done the heater test, which we have not tried out in our plant during the 
during the initial stage. So this also has been done in the closed chamber. So I, we have soaked the vehicle at a minus 15 degree in a closed chamber and then soaked a vehicle for uh, 12 hours and started the engine at the rated RPM and switched on the heating heater and then set to a blower to run for one hour. And then we have logged on all the temperature reading and we have observed that from minus 15 degree in 30 minutes, it has reached 19.51 and 60 minutes it has reached 30.38. As per ISO standard, the delta should be greater than 40 degree and we have reached in one hour 43.57 degree. So this was the, and this test also has been passed as per the ISO 10263. So next is on the window defrost, the, uh, uh, during the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the snow season, the vehicle, the visibility of on the front and the rear uh, has to be validated as per ISO 263. And this also has been soaked at the 15 degrees Celsius. And then uh, the window glass has been left for uh, 30 minutes and the heater has been on. And the maximum airflow has been given to the windscreen. So in 40 minutes, the entire uh, cabin of uh, rear window and the front window has been defrosted and it has a clear view and this also has been passed as per the ISO 10263. So these are the basic validations which we have done during the initial time as per the ISO 263 and uh, we have observed some of the uh, abnormalities which has been missed out and then we have improved on the uh, design of the ducts, the louvers and improved the airflow and we have improved the ceilings and these are the actions which we have taken as per the standard and we have validated the HVAC for the construction equipment. And then the same has been validated with the improved version in the ICAT. And then this also has been proved out. So these are the steps which we have initiated and the, for the HVAC validation. So that's all from my end. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the excellent presentation. It was very precise and relevant presentation on the subject. Thank you. Now we shall again try to Mr. Giris Chavan for the connectivity. So we can uh, see your screen. So well, kindly un unmute yourself. Am I audible now? Yes, sir, you are audible. Sir, just request to open the presentation, please. Yeah. Is, is the presentation is visible now? Uh, no, sir. Yes, sir, it is visible now. 
Okay, thanks a lot. So uh, now uh, two tests are completed that I am audible as well as I am uh, visible. Maybe uh, I am not visible through webcam, it seems. And let me try and that also. Right, sir. You are not audible. You are not visible through webcam. Yes, sir. Am I, I am audible now. Yes, sir. You are audible. Yeah. Okay. So uh, shall we start? Yes, sir. You can. Yeah. Uh, I'm supposed to do the session in the morning uh, session, but now it's perfect afternoon. So I, uh, uh, it is a very good afternoon from Girish Ashok Chawan, who's working, I'm working with Tata Consultancy Services. And uh, a very big thank you to IGET team for organizing such a nice session uh, and uh, webinar in view of uh, 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 this uh, very uh, good reason of uh, giving the awareness to the complete industry about the uh, uh, product development and uh, validation aspects. So once again, I'm thank you. Uh, today we are going to start on the, uh, we are going to talk uh, about my experience in the field of uh, durability and reliability testing methods, which is a very uh, key indicator uh, for in the product development and uh, uh, validation verification. So uh, the flow of information uh, will be uh, like this. Uh, uh, first, uh, initially, we'll talk about the product life management and uh, how the new product development, when, where, and uh, this validation verification activity takes place. In the validation verification, uh, uh, reliability and durability, how does it impact on the product plan? So moving forward, we will talk on a specific uh, topic of reliability and durability overview. And I will take some minutes to talk on reliability and uh, durability interpretation. So uh, that will be uh, majorly about the interpretation as well as the commonality and uh, diversity in understanding about the this uh, concept of uh, durability and reliability which will be uh, majorly on the testing side and that is with the physical testing being my uh, major experiences in the physical uh, testing. In the reliability and durability testing, the next lessons will be on the tools and methods which are being used in uh, uh, reliability and testing. And uh, as the product development cycle has uh, reduced over the period uh, being uh, so much of competition in the market, and product has to come in time to the market and uh, uh, if you are ahead of the market then you definitely get a good market for that the very important part is the conducting the all those uh, product development cycles in a faster way fast forward way so those examples through examples uh, i will uh, give a, uh, some uh, introduction about this accelerator durability and reliability and uh, overall uh, summary of that presentation, which is supposed to be the last slide, last slide but uh, it's a summary will be the multi-dimensional and environmental. Durability testing is a improve, is the uh, key of improvement uh, of the product, uh, that is the reliability. So uh, to start with, uh, this is a, a flow of information we will be having. We, we are going to talk for uh, maybe another 20, 30 minutes on this subject of uh, this to start with that uh, we will uh, first uh, take the product life uh, product life cycle uh, uh, this is a, a product life cycle curve which is represented uh, usually in the uh, in this way which is a type of uh, normal uh, distribution curve being a statistical background, we I use this terminology. This whatever green graph you are able to see, it, it talks about the normal distribution. Uh, X-axis is of course a time, and uh, Y-axis is uh, represented in terms of sales or in terms of count or in terms of production numbers. So first, there are four phases in the product life cycle management. One first is the introduction where the concept, new ideas, and uh, planning of the product is done. And then uh, it, it goes through a lot of R&D work and proof of concept then physical prototyping or digital prototyping and then the development activity goes on and then product gets into the production. 
then it reaches to the level and the counts goes on the product after doing a lot of uh, after the production phase the uh, people do the marketing and uh, people get to know about the product and it, it goes into the growth mode after the certain time period it uh, captures the market it sustains the market and as the time changes and the customer requirement changes it goes into the declination mode it can be re-engineered product or it can be like outdated uh, or getting out of the market like a typewriter is uh, some uh, one example of completely out of the market but whereas the phone and the the automobile vehicles are uh, continuously into the re-engineering mode that is like design one uh, platform one two three so this continuous uh, re-engineering is also happening so it is a uh, com again a cyclic procedure a cyclic process of the uh, product development so uh, it's like a nature uh, it, it uh, particularly for our product industry it is uh, always a re-engineering uh, and in this complete cycle where we uh, we work majorly we work in the uh, domain uh, domain of the product validation so our focus of this presentation or uh, we all are working majorly into this domain of introduction and growth mode uh, phases in product validation there are uh, in in product uh, validation which is very key and uh, important uh, part in the uh, product development activity because it's a very time consuming and that is to particularly physical validation is uh, uh, it's time consuming activity so it has been like always on the key for uh, product to come into the market so in product validation particularly it's for the confirmation of design from paper to real world for that validation is very uh, key so and the, the validation is conducted through virtual validation is done through physical validation is the performance or uh, checking the functional and uh, functional aspects of the product as well as from uh, in which point of view durability point of view validation from the regulation and homologation to as being it is going to be used by the customers like you me and all for them they it should be a safe it should be uh, for use use of uh, use for useful for the human beings for that there are certain iso bis and bs regulations which needs to be fulfilled and those has to be done through the validation and apart from this the validation is of the live testing which uh, has a subs uh, which is uh, nothing but a durability and reliability testing validation for the warranty confirmation from cost point of view and validation from of the reliability testing particularly for the brand point of view and uh, product uh, market sustenance point of view so our presentation will be focused on these uh, three aspects, particularly life testing, warranty information, and uh, uh, reliability testing. So moving on, uh, we will first talk about the uh, we'll talk about the reliability interpretation and durability interpretation. <clears throat> uh, before that, I would like to take a very good quote from Mr. Uh, Niels Bohr, who is a Nobel Prize winner in physics. He has made one statement of prediction is very difficult, especially if it is about the future. So this is uh, relab designed for reliability and reliability testing is one of the attempt to attain this concept. But before that, what is reliability? Reliability is a measure of unanticipated interactions between the customers. Means what? Actually, in, uh, when when uh, it is not expected to any product is not expected to get failure when it. Uh, when it comes into the uh, use of the uh, uh, customer so it is nothing but the uh, unanticipated interruptions means it is an unexpected failures or uh, un uh, un uh, un unexpected uh, things happens from the functional point of view from the life point of view or from the usage point of view that's why the, during the durability test uh, it, it is always a very important goal to maximize the opportunity to, for observing the unexpected failures and uh, if we could able to predict those those can be fixed up uh, before the product comes into the uh, customer side so this way we can uh, say it that we will try to put the future uh, future uh, things which are unexpected or expected to happen in the present time 
that is why the uh, reliability testing is very important so uh, in reliability there are two things uh, which are majorly very important that reliability is designed for reliability flow chart is uh, shown for uh, just to give a glimpse uh, that how how important uh, and each and every phase of the product development uh, reliability is there so from uh, planning to conception phase to layout and uh, design production we decided to recycle these are the various uh, quantitative tools of the uh, reliability like reliability target setting is done with, uh, by getting the qop and taking the subjective information object to then uh, calculation when we do the calculation then uh, while doing it the consideration of the uh, variance parts also the while making the design and development activities which includes validation also by conducting various tests of and uh, doing the test planning applying the marco theory the marco model and boolean theories or fault tree analysis during the uh, testing phase and uh, understanding the reliability curves like bottom curves which i will give a very good example in upcoming slides once the design validation everything is done the pro in production phase the by doing the statistical process planning of that and understanding the uh, uh, variations and product has to be around the mean values and uh, collect after that uh, when it goes into the field then field data analysis is done uh, collecting the information putting it into the curve fittings of variable or normal or log normal distribution to understand the uh, behavior and predicting and interpreting the uh, uh, product uh, uh, product improvement understanding the product improvement and the same information is getting used in the recycling if it has a potential to do the recycling and uh, you make a modified version and use as a, a uh, input for the new level of uh, new next generation product development this is how the complete or overall uh, concept about the design for reliability now uh, moving on on the durability interpretation so durability interpretation durability interpretation uh, when uh, when we say the word durability, durability means it is a durability test to affirm the product that it is from virtual to physical. Uh, while doing the design and uh, uh, development activities, uh, we, there are always some uh, calculation and consideration and uh, expectations from the component to systems to uh, 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 big, uh, uh, at the product. That time, uh, durability test gives you me the affirmation and confirmation about the product that it's uh, from virtual to physical. How, how will it be? So basically, what is the durability? Durability is, uh, I mentioned it in the three ways to understand it. Simplest uh, possible way, uh, it is a uh, attempt. Durability is uh, talks about the length of the product life. Durability talks about the duration of the product ownership. Durability talks about the amount of the use one gets from a product before it gets deteriorated. Why, uh, why uh, to, 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 talk, to talk about the durability in uh, more details, uh, the, the durability is done, uh, durability is, is basically one dimensional test and it is always expressed in terms of, uh, always expressed in terms of uh, uh, DVP, which is a design validation plan. So we, for example, like vibration testing, corrosion testing, step stress testing, Thermal shock testing and environmental testing, but these all are uh, like uh, uh, defined and uh, uh, derived from the experiences and derived from the uh, accumulated information and put it through the some standards like ASTM American Society of Testing for Material Standards, JI Japanese Standard uh, ISO 1601, which specifically talks about the vibration durability, AS 006 also talks about the uh, vibration testing and uh, ISO 16750 which talks about the environmental uh, testing uh, uh, durability testing for majorly for the electronic components but one thing I would like to uh, mention here is uh, these are all one dimensional test in the durability so I, I again emphasize on this world which is going to be really uh, uh, the key differentiator between reliability
also in the simulation world the durability means the it is uh, starts with the static load analysis like uh, when the product is not in the real world then uh, it, through the modeling and uh, by having the virtual model this uh, one dimensional study has uh, is been done for on the product uh, like this is through the one dimensional forces or this may be one example of giving the displacement which is again one dimension so we talk about the uh, durability and reliability interpretation we talk about the durability and reliability interpretation of uh, 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 reliability and durability interpretation now the durability is again uh, is represented by the product uh, ownership whereas reliability is uh, represented uh, as a non performance in usage during the ownership even we try to uh, differentiate or we try to find the commonality uh, so i made some quotes and i made some uh, statements about uh, to differentiate between uh, reliability and durability uh, so we may able to estimate the durability from reliability but we cannot estimate the reliability from durability yes it is a bit uh, uh, confusing but uh, let me take a you know, take some more time on this a uh, durability test is a subset of reliability test why it is so because uh, uh, when i conduct a durability test it is as i earlier said it is a one dimensional maybe for a uh, vibration point of view i will conduct the test and i will say that at certain test and test uh, duration and particular uh, vibration value i will say that this product is durable for this this condition but but when i uh, do it for the environmental testing uh, again i put the similar conditions but uh, when i say my product is reliable means what i am if uh, irrespective of any any environment irrespective of the uh, actual usage or irrespective of the uh, 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 different loading condition my product sustains my product uh, is working means my product is reliable that's why i we always say that is a reliability is a function of multiple durabilities of various materials components different loading conditions and additionally both test looks appears to be very similar from testing mechanics point of view like similar test is being conducted but reliability test time will be getting added with the more dimensions but basically the commonality is both are the life testing uh, methods whereas reliability the durability talks about the pre qualified samples are getting tested uh, uh, pre-qualified pre samples uh, with the simulated environment as I earlier mentioned is like uh, certain loading conditions, certain uh, ambient condition, certain G values and and the pre-qualified samples means typically uh, every sample or uh, set of uh, every uh, component falls in this uh, uh, normal distribution where it has a mean value and it has some variation on the both side. Pre-qualified samples are usually taken like this uh, from this zone and those are getting tested but we are missing on this uh, portion of uh, variance part so how it gets taken care of them in reliability testing basically it is a random sample selection also the actual environmental condition so multi-dimensional inputs coming to that random sample and if it survives then it's a uh, it's a complete uh, overall testing overview testing of the Product. That's why the reliability testing as always as the age over durability testing. <laughs> Again, so if we, we are missing on uh, reliability and durability testing, what it is uh, going to, uh, how, how will it happen, affect on the product? Ultimately, that these are the key indicators and uh, everything is about uh, uh, product brand. If you are missing on this uh, complete consideration of durability and reliability testing, lagging in the development will lead to the de delay the product uh, launch. If everybody is working with a different domain and we usually have some launch date and which usually does not meet because of major reason is that product is not really getting validated, validated with the extent it has been targeted. So it's like uh, nothing is getting green, so we are not launching the product. Then how does it affect? Basically, it uh, it 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 has adverse effects with related to cost also. And if you are missing uh, on that, then it, it leads to the uh, customer dissatisfaction if if he finds the problem. If the product uh, uh, without these uh, 
thing it 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 increases the maintenance uh, of maintenance activities on the product and uh, also the warranty gets affected and more number of warranties means a lot of uh, work for the logistics guys a lot of work for the manufacturing for uh, giving the spare parts and uh, so spare part service and uh, brand team has to work uh, it, uh, this team has to work more on that this leads to call for the vehicle recalls we had uh, seen a lot of vehicle recalls uh, examples in between 2012 to 2018 i clearly remember that uh, there are many many uh, oems has uh, come up with this vehicle recalls it's like sometimes we uh, we missed on uh, issues related to which may lead to the safety concerns but it ultimately affects on the uh, brand as well degradation of the product basically it, product gets uh, uh, out of the market very soon and uh, being it's uh, degraded but it does not have a very usable values also the failures during the time intervals leads to the effect on the uh, product uh, brand uh, also the this leads to the quality indices uh, score gets down for the uh, company and uh, reduces its reputation and the product uh, safety which is uh, which is a very big concern for from human life point of view so so what is very what is very important into this is that we should not miss on any testing but it has to be done in very uh, 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 in a way so that product will come into the market and uh, in way uh, in a way within a time or a right time in the market so for a very key message for all the people uh, who are into the validation and being a validation engineer my my always emphasis should be my durability testing sh shall be done in such a cost effective manner as well as in in accordance with or in compliance with the reliability testing to take care and that is the key success for every validation engineer. then how how to uh, achieve this so there are uh, different uh, tools and methods are available again i put up this quote from uh, niche score is to, uh, to if it is uh, a prediction is very difficult especially if it is about the future so uh, these are the one attempt or these are the things some methods which will definitely help us to uh, achieve or uh, attain this concern there are uh, different methods in reliability testing so there are multi-dimensional testing test test along with the environmental test which takes care of, uh, uh, which will incorporate the uh, cyclic loading, durability loading, as well as uh, space, as well as from forces, from uh, environmental conditions point of view. All the things come together, and which will be the real replication of uh, uh, real world usage uh, execution in the short term. So, so, how to do that again? It's a road load data, which is a very uh, favorite subject for all validation uh, team all validation engineers so road load data is a glimpse or the sample information or some part of the product which is going into the future and you get uh, some highlight of it it's like a trailer uh, of uh, trailer of, uh, of one complete uh, movie you get it uh, through this road load data so that that uh, by con doing that thing on the proving ground as well as on the road or as well as on the lab we should we can conduct this test and this is one of the method of the next is design of experiment people majorly use the design of experiment for activity or the tool or the method particularly for root cause analysis but as well as it, it it basically talks about the multiple variable inputs has an impact on the output so that's why the factorial method or Taguchi method or full uh, full and partial factorial methods will be useful to identify the uh, effective reliability test. Also, the random selection, uh, random sample selection, has earlier said that uh, there will shall be no pre-qualification of the sample and just uh, that gives a better confidence in terms of uh, and addressing the all uh, all range of the uh, variation of the samples and that that's a random sample selection gives a better uh, is a uh, more towards the reliability test also the verification shall be done on the smaller sample and validation on the larger sample uh, 
uh, verification is uh, about like evaluating the performance or checking the performance or checking the or getting the glimpse of the uh, of the product or the samples or of the subsystems or the systems but validation shall be on the larger sample it's when the larger samples it gives the basically why it is necessary is to build the confidence and locate the confidence so what input is required for uh, doing this reliability testing or uh, getting uh, implementing this method so very important input is come from the customer voice uh, which is a subject to uh, activity and qfd which is quality function deployment converting the uh, customer voice into the objective terms which is again uh, these are the basically part of uh, uh, design for reliability tools and uh, who, from where we get this information is uh, through the benchmarking activity if the extensive level of benchmarking activities is, becomes the input for your uh, your uh, uh, testing uh, uh, for testing methods now there are different tools these are the methods we spoke about it uh, there are the different tools available in the market for uh, uh, available in the market as well as we can do it with the 1d simulation by using our uh, mathematical uh, type uh, mathematical by doing some mathematical uh, analysis and mathematical uh, uh, tools uh, there are fta analysis which is a fault for tree analysis methods design of experiment table that example i will show it as a glimpse in this slide regression which is the statistical tool analysis of variance variable analysis uh, very popular in uh, reliability testing power law model basically talks about the accelerated and uh, doing the uh, doing the quick success uh, the doing the testing in quick succession way rain flow matrix by using the tools like uh, which are available with the data analysis tool makers uh, the rain flow matrix which will give me the uh, uh, complex data into the simplified version we want beat in life uh, analysis which helps to predict the warranty as well as the uh, usable life useful life of the product and joint probability distribution basically useful in uh, doing this uh, design of experiment that multiple input has a uh, impact on uh, reliability and uh, reliability prediction of the product so uh, in continuing to the method of reliability testing, uh, I, I would like to give the three examples or uh, just want to show you the examples of uh, uh, reliability test methods. So uh, basically the first first example I would like to talk about is uh, get the sample load data and uh, from the real world environment. There is one method of doing the fatigue editing and get the use of the physics, physics of the material and SN curves to the fatigue editing and simulate the data into the testing. And that that simulation shall be done. Uh, simulation will be conducted and uh, executed on the on the lab. And that that is that that falls into the accelerator, which will give a very early prediction about the product uh, product maturity, also about the confidence on the product and uh, more number of samples testing in the validation shall be done for that there is one more way of doing it collecting the sample data doing the rain flow analysis and uh, generating the duty cycles which can be in terms of uh, uh, using the joint probability distributions combination of the multiple uh, inputs together and executing the uh, test simulation so four poster or six degree of freedom for testing uh, are the best example of that so this is a one example of accelerated test. So, and the next is uh, from where all this service road simulation information comes in. So that is from the road load data. Uh, from design and from the customer voice and from marketing, we get the usage profile from customer. We understand the driving pattern, like average speed, typical speed, object, or ABC operations and uh, or uh, aggressive uh, operations on the product particularly about the automotive oil, I would like that. From the design, there are uh, some design considerations. Those inputs by taking it and uh, vehicle is can take another on the different roads and terrains uh, to get the real life, real, real world information. And uh, by conducting the this all three, six degree of information or uh, six degree of three degree of the information and putting it into one degree of the, in the tabular way, 
and generating the test report and developing the correlation of uh, of this field data into the uh, torture track and do it in the uh, uh, shorter way and uh, in a limited premises that is on the proving ground so here is some exa some photos which are taken from the google images we are not supposed to share in share uh, we are not supposed to share uh, uh, any track information so i i am sh showing you the some torture track uh, graphs uh, torture track images sorry and this is a very good uh, one example of design of experiment basically multiple uh, variable inputs has an impact on uh, impact on, or the combination of multiple uh, inputs on the output uh, on the desirable output so where we are uh, really reaching uh, or going towards and which combination and uh, which parameter range we should uh, do for that there are two level three level of uh, factorial design and the design of experiment so those are been uh, uh, these are the typical tools in the reliability test uh, sir, so i'm giving you one uh, sorry yeah. to interrupt you sir you have five more minutes to go sir yeah yeah i'm almost done yeah yeah thanks okay. we are almost thanks. on the last slides yeah thanks no thanks issue. for reminding me yeah yeah okay <laughs> Now uh, about the mo most important part about the uh, reliability and durability testing, I would like to take one example of the real differences between the reliability and durability testing. The durability testing is one example I have put in, uh, put it is the door open and close operation and uh, durability of the door. Uh, typically every, uh, every OEM has their own uh, standard uh, number of cycles uh, to run. They, which we do it in the uh, our lab, uh, which is a uh, open and uh, uh, normal ambient temperature condition lab, open environment. There is no no control on that, and uh, no controllable parameters from other than this uh, operation speed of the uh, door opening and close. Uh, this test has been conducted in number of blocks, and uh, there are conducted some certain number of rounds to check the durability of the. Uh, uh, or giving the confirmation that my door is uh, is going to work for the throughout the life of the vehicle, but that this is a durability test. Now, now in the in, in the reliability test, how does it differ basically between the reliability? We will conduct the uh, this may be let's say some lakhs of the or uh, uh, multiple thousands of the test. This may be uh, multiple of hundred tests only can be done in the reliability testing. By making the variation in the speed of the operations of the door, by changing the different temperature conditions, along with the humidity conditions, and along with the uh, variation in the uh, doors uh, uh, connecting points like hinges and other things. So this complete combination of this, if we do it with the factorial matrix of the temperature and humidity, some with increased number of rounds for the testing we can we are uh, we can we, we can say that it is a real world test environment survival indicates that the if it survives it indicates the higher reliability means the confidence is very high on the product if i i if i drive or i use this uh, vehicle whether in the north india south india east or west because we we know that the india represents the complete world's uh, environmental situation like low sub-zero temperature to uh, highest temperature somewhere in the western india and lowest temperature in northern india and also the higher humidity in the coastal area so so this is a complete uh, uh, complete uh, uh, complete environmental and all the conditions are in getting captured uh, in India, so that's why if we with the product sh shall be validated with those all aspects consideration. That's why the reliability testing. If we do it, then uh, we are more confident about the product. So, uh, in reliability testing, the every reliability engineer cannot complete his presentation without uh, this path of curve, which talks about the infant mortality, which is early uh, prediction, which is the failure rate is decreasing, but uh, Use the real idea about the uh, design uh, failure and helps to do the product more uh, improvement in uh, insertion. These are the random uh, failures which are uh, maybe constant or maybe normal operations and 
this talks about the year of and end of the life uh, failures if it goes through the normal now if i put it in the reliability and durability terminology uh, i can i can say that it is the, this is this is the reliability testing which helps if i conduct a worst of worst analysis take a worst of worst samples and do the uh, uh, running on the uh, uh, accelerated uh, track for example power track i will get very early prediction of the worst part and i can do the design improvement whereas if i do uh, if i take a predefined like a very uh, uh, very uh, design intended uh, components and parts and do the durability testing in the power so i will whatever the failures i will get it this represents my end of it so this is the way the big difference in the bar top corrosive we can present for the durability and reliability so uh, this is a overview uh, about the uh, reliability and durability uh, yeah, at the express so throughout this lessons i made one uh, single statement is like uh, reliability testing is always uh, having is uh, is uh, is like it's it's really represents the all aspect of uh, or multi multiple uh, durability uh, activities are been taken care in the reliability test so multi dimensional environmental durability testing is to improve the reliability of it. this approach is need to meet the future in the present so this is so far my experience i have shared with you all what next then there are still lot of improve uh, some areas we we where in we should work on is like reliability testing with no sample or one sample the kind of maturity we have achieved through now so many is the numbers of samples test or so many tests conducted for so many years also the reliability testing is the shortest possible uh, time duration how to do it like people used to use the word of h a l d h a s s a similar way uh, we, we, i i personally like to introduce the word like uh, instead of accelerated reliability test it should be a highly accelerated reliability test but yet to maintain the shape of the distribution when i say shape of the distribution every reliability testing falls into this different terms and it should if it does not for uh, which represents its product uh, overall distribution that it should not lose the uh, the shape of the failures to achieve that there is a lot of need uh, of work is to be a lot of uh, work needs to be done also the durability testing with all dimension with uh, degree of uh, uh, design of experiment approach to identify the critical improvement area with the definition of one particular niche so this for that in the morning session i had seen satya prakash uh, from uh, expressed about the that uh, very fantastic thing and also we can use similar tools for uh, doing this approach and definitely we help on improving or uh, uh, this work uh, this work in and doing the reliability testing in more more precise and very in disciplined and in very short and also the favorite topic of road load data which is a i we personally we feel it that it is a inherent reliability testing approach now how reliability and how re, how rld is both, both can be uh, make it in the more uh, uh, putting into the basket of uh, accelerated reliability testing and highly accelerated these are the next uh, things i'm really uh, we are we should work on and i'm, I'm going to work on those areas so and uh, so by saying this i am very thankful to you all for uh, patiently listening me for the last 30 35 minutes thanks a lot any questions please you can write me down on the mail or we can uh, we can have a chat through my linkedin profile okay thanks thank you very much thank you sir for the excellent presentation it was relevant presentation on the subject thank you thank you thank you now for the fifth presentation of the webinar i would like to welcome mr ratadeep ghosh mr ghosh has completed btech degree in automotive engineering along with a pgdm in operations and has over 12 years of experience in fatigue durability testing at present mr ghosh is working as a manager in fatigue test laboratory at icat he has been a project leader for numerous project related to design validation durability and performance 
uh, at Veckel aggregate and component level. Previously, he had also presented his work in prestigious forums, seminars, symposium across the country. We welcome you, sir. Mr. Ghosh will be presenting on topic development of methodology for powertrain and structural duty cycle in construction equipment. I now request Mr. Ghosh to proceed with his presentation. Sir. Uh, is my screen visible? Uh, sir, it's visible. Yeah, it's visible now. So the subject and we are going to be focusing uh, today uh, would be the development of uh, the methodology for the powertrain and structural duty cycle in construction equipment. These are two projects, uh, projects which you have already conducted uh, at our end. And uh, I would like to focus on like how we arrived at the methodologies and uh, how we kind of culminated in the actual testing from the raw data that we collected on PDF. a second yeah uh, so the objective is to create the powertrain and structural duty cycle for powertrain aggregates for construction equipment in which will be the main methodology would be to identify the location of sensors the data validation then will be done during the testing ensuring the right data inputs analyze the test data from two machines uh, received from the customer define the structural duty cycle stresses on uh, the defined location with respect to the road load and inputs and the power and duty cycle power and characteristics such as R, uh, rpm uh, temperature and can channels with respect to the road load inputs uh, the process approach would be first we'll be planning uh, we'll be doing the detailed study of study of the power train of the system uh, then finalizing the channel list and define the location of the sensors like accelerometers, strain gauges, and the RPM locations uh, to derive the right uh, torque and the power that is flowing through the power train. And then the in the execution stage, we'll be uh, checking the data as per the channel list and uh, doing the test and uh, uh, installing cameras so that we have a correlation between what we are capturing to what is actually happening on field. And then after that, we after the collecting of the data, we'll be uh, doing the data analysis from which we'll be forming two cycles first being the structural duty cycle and the other being the power train duty cycle uh, this is the a small uh, process flow which you had defined like first we'll do the system study and instrumentation then uh, we'll go to the field in order to do the in-field measurement as per the real world usage pattern then uh, we collect the data and uh, we define uh, uh, our, our desired output from it and from there, we'll be uh, creating the damage editing to remove all the non-damaging percentage. And from there, we'll be forming an accelerator duty cycle in which we'll be coming to the bench, using which we'll be coming to the bench and uh, we'll be testing the actual aggregate on the on the bench. So that is our mode of doing it. So first, we need to understand the powertrain and the powertrain, uh, how the power is, is flowing uh, throughout the powertrain. Uh, so after after deep study, we found that uh, this is the layout in which uh, uh, it, it flowed from the engine to the torque converter, from the, then to the transmissions, from transmissions to the bevel gear, then to the steering, and then to the final via the final drive, the actual wheels. So we we had to define uh, we had limited number of channels uh, around 27 in which uh, uh, we had derived the gear ratios, and uh, from there we basically derived all the other channels by uh, computational methods we derive the other channels and from there uh, after deriving the, uh, the other channels then we went ahead and formed the actual accelerated duty cycle so we had written on eight pages of script to derive on that so these are the outcomes uh, uh, which we got from the data which we collected first being the brake pressure application the gear utilization the joint distribution uh, for the vehicle speed along with the gear uh, that is the average vehicle speed during the operation in specific gear then the joint distribution in the engine torque and gear 
and then the transmission durability so these are will be our motto and objective of doing this test to form this duty cycle and durability performance uh, now uh, in this machine there was a uh, torque converter so we use this uh, formula polynomial formula to derive the torque which is flowing coming from the engine and through the uh, torque converter flowing to the to the gearbox so uh, where we had to define the capacity factor and the torque ratio which is as, as a function of torque will give me the, the, the power along with the rpm uh, from that we have de derived that uh, uh, by correlating that and by formulating we have derived uh, we, uh, the the engines uh, the vehicle speed the by, by the vehicle speed once you get that we correlated that with the actual vehicle speed that we measured on field and we could simulate the same to 95 percent accuracy so these are the duty cycle that we derived so like we can see i'll briefly explain like about how it explains so uh, this is the basically the percentage time uh, the steering uh, system has spent its cycle onto like if you if you see there's the rpm this is the uh, torque output which is coming uh, to the steering so if you have to test the steering system for its uh, durability then you have to input the torque and the rpm and through that we can see that these are the areas which are marked in, 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 in circles. These are the area in which the maximum uh, the density of the data is. So basically we'll we'll test the data and test the system using this uh, this duty cycle in, as a combination of torque and RPM. So likewise, we have reduced the total time of uh, doing the testing to almost 4% of the total test time. Because these other areas which won't be uh, won't be much used to me because in those areas the vehicle haven't worked much likewise we have derived the cycle for the transmission so this in turn will give me uh, a, a a cycle in which we will be able to simulate that in the test rig and uh, by giving the torque and the rpm in the, in the test rig within those two data i can do perform a durability cycle of the steering system of the transmission as well as the complete power trip. So next, I'll uh, quickly go through the structural uh, part of it. So, so in the structure, uh, so basically, I'll first like to highlight the difference in the uh, in the approach of uh, deriving the structural duty cycle in a uh, in a construction equipment juxtaposing to the car, like we do in cars. So in in cars, basically, we are we deal with the uh, free vibrations, like the continuous acceleration and the motion excitations. These are no constant free body vibrations uh, in which the uh, load the load is coming from the uh, from the road in which the sprung mass is in the free vibra uh, body vibration and it's actually a mix of both force and free body the sprung mass is in the free, free body vibration and the unsprung mass is in the force vibration wherein in in case of a uh, construction equipment the load is transferred uh, via the uh, constant hard points which are uh, the pins basically that is acting between the hook and the uh, and and the hook and the and the stick basically so so next the overall methodology if you talk about uh, about the approach about how you do it so like first we'll do the market survey uh, then the we'll define the customer usage pattern then we'll do the vehicle instrumentation then the measurement techniques we'll have to define then the road load data acquisition as well as the data analysis then, then the data after the analysis will integrate the data and then carry out the vehicle level schedule and the aggregate level schedule test. So in the vehicle, uh, the durability uh, most most uh, like uh, will be divided into two parts, one the vehicle level and uh, on road and will be, one other one will be the track test. So the vehicle mix would be like uh, in, the, in the form of a general highway, city, uh, expressway, guard, guard section. There will be a mix of it. And then uh, we'll do perform a track test. Uh, durability then to establish a correlation between the service load data along with the track data then we'll go ahead and simulate the track data on the field i mean on the machines so this is the ro uh, road mix uh, i was talking about so this is then the typical plan about uh, how will you go about uh, uh, planning a durability cycle in case of a, uh, a vehicle so uh, suppose national highway state highway route one route two like these are routes i haven't mentioned like uh, specific routes but these are the root, root types 
then uh, we'll be do, uh, doing the same kind of testing on uh, on track uh, on track uh, uh, by tag by, by namely Belgian pave, bottles, cobblestone, herringbone, rough road. We'll form a mix of that along with the laden and unladen conditions. And then uh, this uh, this is a slight overview of the instrumentation. Uh, we'll be generally using four accelerations uh, at the four corners of the car. Uh, the displacement sensors for, to establish the correlation. Uh, and the strain gauges, if at all that is needed, uh, which to find out any critical uh, positions which are uh, defined by the CA analysis. So these are again some instrumentation photos for the four uh, accelerometers. And this is a typical flow to do the da damage calculation. Uh, after this, uh, this uh, defining, collecting the data on track, we'll be doing uh, typical uh, this damage calculation. And from the damage calculation, we'll find out uh, the tracks in which uh, we are being able to derive the damaging uh, the, dam the da damaging uh, portions of it. So after doing this damage calculations, uh, uh, like we can see, I mean, for example, we can see that uh, this corrugated at 10 kmph, we are getting some uh, some values for the total damage. Others we are not getting any value. So we'll consider this values. I mean, this this track, this track. Uh, uh will fix and then uh, we'll move ahead with the further analysis on that so after the uh, analysis is i mean this uh, damage correlation is est established like event one event two event three event four uh, as you can see i have we have defined it we'll find out the total damage so after we find the total damage then we have uh, we also compare this the track damage along with the damage which you found over the service road data Suppose service road data has, has run for uh, suppose 500 kilometers, and we can see that in the track uh, that uh, the damaging portions are only of three kilometers. So basically, we are reducing the test time uh, by doing this. So then, uh, after that, this is the test for After uh, after that, uh, collecting the data and establishing the damage uh, correlation, we are. Uh, doing the physical testing uh, on on the machines using four posters so now in this uh, construction equipment basically i uh, so there, there are basically two methods in which we we undertook one is a stage life method and the other is a strain life method uh, the stage life the stage life is basically uh, for the component which are uh, under the stage limit like steel and the high strain materials and which are uh, applicable for high cycle fatigue and uh, and this test life analysis damage is accumulated in elastic range only. So and uh, for the for the other welded parts and the uh, parts where the stress concentration is more and which corresponds to the low cycle fatigue, we we define another par uh, parts and locations where this uh, stain life analysis uh, can be taken place. So this is the approach uh, that, we, that we took basically. So the stress concentration, uh, we uh, we form a list of uh, the the operations that the machine undergoes, and then we define that uh, how much percentage uh, the machine percentage the uh, out of the total life the machine can uh, can undergo. So we we form a correlation of that and then form a cycle with respect to the that. So there are two kinds of operation we formed into. One is the continuous operation, and another is the discrete operation, which is the impact and the one-time activity. So we define those uh, activities then as a number, and uh, the total predicted the total number uh, the vehicle can undergo these operations in in their lifetime. After that, we define the the strain locations, the pressure, the accelerations, and the travel. Uh, then we gauge the pins because the force is ultimately going to be flowing through the pins only. So uh, we we gauge the pins and uh, this is this we are doing a calibration along the x and the y axis uh, because ultimately we'll be using actuators in x and y axis so that's why we are doing the calibration in x and y axis so after that we uh, prepare a schedule then the damage estimation is done again and after that uh, by using stress and uh, strain life analysis we find out the the locations in which the uh, failure can take place and uh, after that, uh, we we try and tr uh, we we try to simulate the same uh, inside a, uh, our uh, universal test benches, uh, through which uh, by with the help of two and few actuators, we are simulating the load 
which which we have calibrated and we are getting here uh, in in the channel list we are trying to simulate the same load here and after we do the simulation then we have to run some block cycles with respect to this so this is a brief about uh, the methodology that we used uh, for uh, just to showcase how we did it uh, in automotive we first do the instrumentation then do the data collection and the data analysis and then testing uh, uh, the basic difference is here we'll be using accelerometers and displacement whereas in, in case of construction equipment we'll be using uh, strain gauges primarily for the and and then uh, obviously calibrating it to attain the loads then do the data collection uh, on field that remains same for both the cases and then after doing the stress and strain based uh, damage calculation uh, with the real SN curve then we'll be doing the testing uh, with the help of actuators in UTPs. thank you for your attention Thank you, sir, for the excellent presentation. It was full of relevant data on the subject. Thank you. Now for the final and sixth presentation of the webinar, I would like to welcome Mr. Santosh Gosavi. Mr. Gosavi has 25 years of experience in design and development of automotive system and component. At present, Mr. Gosavi is working as general manager in door testing in engineering research center at Tata Motors Pune. He is responsible for conducting indoor testing performance attribute management, digital product development, durability, reliability, and customer correlation. He had presented 12 technical papers and articles in various national and international journals and symposium. He had also filed 16 patent and 20 copyrights. We welcome you, sir. Mr. Gosavi will be presenting on topic, a study of effect on road infrastructure changes on structural fatigue damage. I now request Mr. Gosavi to please proceed with his presentation, sir. Sure, uh, thank you for the kind introduction. My pleasure, sir. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Screen is visible. Okay. Thank you. Right. Okay. So the previous speaker spoke about uh, the importance of road load data. How to use this road load data in deriving various structural and power train durability test cycles. spoke about much in detail the customer correlation the instrumentation which is a integral part of the road load data analysis and reliability as well so my today's topic of interaction is basically i will be sharing some of insights which we have learned in understanding the effect of road infrastructure it has on the vehicle damage or fatigue damage for structural aggregates. Unlike uh, developed countries like US and European countries, our Indian road network and infrastructure is still evolving and we are moving towards the smart roads and that's what the vision the government of india has and of each of our, each of one has witnessed massive improvement in the road infrastructure in the last couple of decades and it has a impact on the national economy safety comfort 
transport industry at large. So, but this something, this road infrastructure, though we feel this is, uh, this is something infrastructure improvement, the way nation is building, it has some kind of bearing, some kind of impact on auto industry as well. And hence, for Indian OEMs, it is very important for us to pay attention towards this and capture the learnings for better tomorrow and better product designs. So my presentation is actually briefed in five topics. So we'll, I'll give you some insight on the Indian road network and infrastructure, the current status and how it has evolved. We'll look for what are the measurement techniques available, how you quantify the road quality, what the significance it has for the auto industry. Then brief case study and findings what we observed. And then we'll have a last topic of share the results and we'll discuss if any questions are then we'll take it up after that. Now let's look at this is what the in one slide if you have to really understand the Indian road network. So it is actually second largest road network in the world. However, now we take this pride calling ourselves as a second largest road network country, but the quality of roads is still far away from the developed nations. And we are, of course, we are moving towards it. Now, if you really look at the connect percentage of the rural roads, which is about 70%, which is a major chunk. So this shows that the connectivity in the remote areas and in the rural areas has improved a lot. Now this entire road network actually contributes to the transportation of 65%, nearly 65% of goods and 90% of total passenger traffic it handles. So it's so it, it's it's like a lifeline for any economy. Hence, the government of India is putting a lot of budget and infrastructural improvements to improve it and make it state of art. But still, if you really look at the contribution of national highway and the state highway, which we feel those are the good roads, is still around 5.6%. And this both together handles actually majority of the goods and passenger traffic. Now, if you look at into the history of this road infrastructural network improvement and how it was started, if you go back eight decades back, post independence, it was nothing. And then it has gradually become the second largest road network in the world. But the growth rate, if you look at in 21st century, since the beginning of 21st century, the rate of growth is high. It's really accelerated after that. Now, if you, if you really zoom into it and let's understand, we generally 
have these national highways, how the national highway has grown. So we have seen that the rapid expansion, if you look at up in after year 2000 to now current era, there's a drastic change. The, the way construction, the road highways and national highways are being constructed, the pace of the construction is very high. Whereas on state highway, it's a steady growth. And we also uh, seen that many state highways are now getting converted into national highways. Similarly, in rural, we can see the rural, the connectivity in the villages, in the rural mm -hmm. part and remote part of the India has improved a lot. Again, after year 2000, we see the massive, the major change. It has improved a lot. Whereas urban road, it's typically keeps on improving as a study, as at a study rate. Now, this is something interesting to see. If you compare the last two decades, what how the changes have happened in the different road types. We can see about 60% improvement is in the national highway or decade over decade. Whereas state highway probably not much focus in this uh, last decade. Rural area improved, urban areas again. But major takeaway from this is that the 60% growth in national highway in last 10 years, it is something recomm recommendable and it has lots of bearing and impact on auto industry as well. Now, why this has happened, like you, you must be knowing that the government of India has uh, Bharat Mala Pariyojana, the India's largest infrastructure program, which is being initiated in 2017 to develop about 34,800 kilometer of national highway corridor connecting 600 plus districts. So this is definitely helping us for smooth and hassle-free transport of goods and passengers across the nation. What, how it has resulted in auto industry that you must be observed in last 10 years that customer base, particularly from commercial vehicle, if I have to state about, major shift has happened from two XL and three XL trucks to the multi XL trucks, five XL and six XL trucks. So that's a major shift we have observed in the the customer demand. So this is, an, in nutshell, these are the improvements and the changes we have observed in the into the Indian road network. Now let's look at how to quantify this road network or quality of the road, how to measure. Now generally, you must have come across this aspect or you must have read it somewhere that international roughness index is one of the most commonly used to measure the road roughness across globe and it is generally measured the unit of measurement is millimeter per kilometer kind of thing the other attribute which is I think that is more uh, relevant to the auto industry is road surface texture. And then this road surface texture is something also one is one of the one of the quality measurement tool and how however it is does not have any closer global acceptance as such. However, the few countries still follow this road surface texture, but not being used to compare it across the globe. So it has mainly classified as a micro, micro and mega structure, depending upon the uh, the road disturbance and the type of uh, road roughness it has. So micro and micro texture defines the type of road finish and mainly contributes in tire road noise, wet and dry tire traction ride comfort and other vehicle dynamic attributes whereas the mega texture 
is important from safety point of view, vehicle safety, strength point of view, durability, and reliability of the product. It helps to quantify rough roads by counting the number of potholes or ditches of different sizes within the range of 50 to 500 millimeter on a given length of the road. If, if this is a simple way by which we can understand what is the road surface texture is. So there are methods available. There is standard available, in fact, how to for measurement of IRI and calculate the IRI. So generally, this IRI is basically this kind of instrumented uh, van or some kind of van is there and it has uh, this vehicle is equipped with laser profile meters if you really look at which is mounted just ahead of the bumper front bumper and a few gyro sensors accelerometers and so and so then onboard calculation system some uh, then analysis software and so on so so the ledger height sensor data is then compensated actually when the vehicle is driven of course the vehicle moves up and down because of these inertial effects then it is compensated this the laser data is compensated for the vehicle inertial movements using some other onboard inertial sensors and then you achieve this and then you can obtain the uh, road quality or roughness index or road texture surface texture from this generally such activities are carried out by government uh, authorities like uh, national highway authority of india or equivalent to that and even automotive industries also uh, we also make use of such kind of facilities to scan the our proving grounds or 3d road speed what we call it which 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 is essential for embedded simulations of vehicle dynamics and durability assessments so this is how this the data uh, we can capture which help us to identify understand what kind of road how rough it is how good it is how bad it is and so and so and then you can do the comparison with if uh, globally available data and then make our own conclusions and inference out of it now let's look at why we are discussing this or why we are talking about the road infrastructural improvement everyone knows everyone is witnessing everyone is daily observing the road infrastructure is improved we speak about it many times but what does it mean for us as automotive industry that is something we need to uh, deep dive and understand so for that purpose we need to first look into it what are the challenges we have the automotive industry as such the current challenges if you have to really classify we what we see that the business uncertainty is very high the economic conditions are changing drastically the cost of input input cost is rising up and up then availability of raw material and skill manpower is something at the stake on other side the sustainability is driving everything actually we have gone to bs6 now bs6 phase 2 now safety regulations are coming forward so sustainability is something demanding a lot of things from the auto industry to so that what is expect that the vehicle should be safe and environment friendly that's what the focus on the new regulations now of course any new regulation comes in so it's automotive industries 
outlook to really how to achieve that how to fulfill those requirements the capex required the investment it it has on other side the competition is increasing and at the same time the customer preferences are changing rapidly so industry has revolution actually really look at now we are talking of a connected car autonomous car and vehicles people are talking of emission free vehicles battery electric hydrogen vehicles shared mobility so everything so if you really look at the automotive industry somewhere is from all sides lots of challenges and within that we have to really make it happen meet the regulations meet the customer expectations meet the cost targets meet the budget everything so under this scenario what is the role of the design and development team or any r&d team so r&d team any r&d team r&d center has three major deliverables that is optimized product for the weight optimized cost of the vehicle that is dmc direct material cost and of course time to market as soon as possible that's what these are the th these three challenges for any r&d center or design and development team when we talk of design optimization for any part you take any suspension part or any other part generally the design optimization targets are the part has to meet the strength requirement so that the vehicle should be safe and the design should be robust stiffness is something governed by to have more agile vehicle feel and refined durability we everyone understands the product should be reliable so it has to meet durability targets as well now feasibility is something which is really becoming a uh, a top most agenda nowadays that the part should be easy to manufacture assemble and service another two are the weight and cost so it is expected that whatever you release to the production post development is it should be optimized on weight and optimized on cost so after having understanding this uh, background the challenges the automotive industry has and under these challenges the design and development engineer what he has to do what are his priorities now i'm just moving up after having this i'll just move it on the next topic uh, next uh, uh, this thing i'll just coming back to the uh, the main agenda of the presentation is how the road infrastructural improvements and what does it mean for auto industry now in earlier days like pre digital or before digital transformation probably early 1990s the test and see load cases mostly those were based upon the oem experience learning previous learning and based upon some national and international standards that's how that that time available as such which we have seen the sophisticated systems and softwares in today's world so and of course whatever the the earlier uh, method was there those were can lead to under and over design nobody knows 
if it sustains good it could be over design or it can be just be fit to fit the fit the requirement but that is something were unknown that time but post digital transformation all we know the way the things have changed the way the computer and softwares helped us to really the instrumentation the sensors and so on so so many things have changed and helped us to really understand the about the road what the usage profile and so on so but here so what are we develop based upon this test standards and ce load cases what are we develop after understanding the road load data customer usage those are mainly then depended upon road network and quality of the roads because that is something influence it has influence on that. now this is a typical any for structural durability process all we know the previous speaker also spoke about it now let's look at once we have the data how the data is being used the road load data so this data is is something which is very critical the road load data is very critical and vital process and it has a major contribution in entire design and development process in deciding durability reliability and strength attributes these are the design attributes so this plays an important role now this data is further cascaded down to develop the vehicle level test schedule system level test schedules data for power train bit for a structural parts and it is being used for actually validating the components and systems so ultimately it has a impact on deciding the component mass and weight the material the component material being used manufacturing process cost so it is a two dimension that it plays a role one it it assures that the part or vehicle or car should be durable reliable should meet the requirement at the same time it plays a role in deciding the material to be selected the mass ultimately because it has to meet the test requirement it has to qualify the ca requirements the mass and the weight of the component and cost of the component now this is so this is how we we have seen that what a influence it has on the design and development process now before we get into the case study we actually we had a two approach to analyze and understand the effect of road infrastructural changes so one is a virtual way by which it would have been helped us to do it quickly but in typical way that you need to scan the roads and then use it into the embedded simulation and derive the virtual road load data and use it for further analysis and study but having this uh, the scanning the road is something very challenging and currently it's very limited resources are available across the globe and those are very costly hence we have taken a traditional approach to understand the effect of road infrastructure on the vehicle so we have choose we have chosen four vehicles actually representing one from passenger car one from suv one from small commercial vehicle and one from Uh, heavy commercial vehicle 
However, while selecting the vehicle, we have ensured that we have the previously acquired data on those vehicles so that we can use it for the comparison purpose. Now we understand this, how this data is sensitive to the service roads, payload, environment, and driving style, because these are the influencing parameters which ultimately decide the severity or, or the level of the road load data, the kind of damage it will reproduce into the vehicle structure. And each, and each has its contribution. Now let's look, look at what is the contribution. So based upon our experience, what we have seen that the influence from the road type, the service road or the road quality and the road mix is highest as compared to the other three uh, variables. Of course, the after the road, the loading conditions matters most. And then driving style and environment. Maybe from Indian context, environment is not so critical. Then this is a typical approach, which we have earlier also seen that this kind of uh, the four vehicles, what we selected for the purpose of understanding the road infrastructural changes, those vehicles were taken and the data was collected on types of roads, national highway, state highway, city, rough road and hills and mountains as per the mix. And then data was analyzed for them. Now this is a typical instrumentation being was used. Generally, uh, the most, the if you really understand, want to understand the reliability of the data, road load data then the and with lesser influence of vehicle dynamics vehicle kinematics and uh, the suspension kinematics and compliance we the measurement of the wheel loads is more reliable and it has a very less influence of vehicle parameters on it though it has the vehicle parameters influence on it but as compared to other sensors like uh, displacement, then accelerations and so on and so on. That is more generic, we can call it. Uh, the load measurement, the wheel load measurement is more generic measurement. Now, when we collect the data, generally this is a The maturity of the data like we keep on collecting the data until it becomes mature like we call it as a statistically stable data so statistical table data what does it mean that as i accumulating more and more distance we should not experience higher loads like on x-axis we should not see much changes our, of course, on cycle count, it can grow, it can move up and up as we accumulate more and more distance. So at certain at certain kilometer, you you observe that there is there is not much movement on the x-axis, and everything moves up in the y-axis. So that time we we say okay, data is matured and that is sufficient to have the statistical distribution. Now we are understanding now now we are going into this uh, understanding that changes what we have observed now he, what you see here old data and new data these are the two press on the plot old data means about uh, data collected about a two decade ago maybe 20 years back data A new data is recent, recently acquired data. Now this, what we see is a speed, vehicle speed. So what does it, what it shows that probably if you really at the top speed, more or less it's same. We don't see much changes between the two data sets. However, 
most of the time if you look at the distribution now the most of the time the vehicle is driven in higher speeds in the new data set the blue line almost 10 times of the old data now the next plot what we are seeing is a uh, wheel loads wheel loads in terms of uh, we call it as a g value now g value is something the dynamic force measure at the wheel divided by static wheel load now the, if we, the here also we see the peak loads going above 3g maybe more or less both in new set and old data set both are experiencing in excess of 3g but the cycle count the number of point count or cycle count have reduced drastically so it means between earlier and now the road irregularities and portfolio characteristics remain same however the occurrence is reduced as a result of improved road infrastructure so in other word if you have to really say that probably 20 years back potholes were there even nowadays also potholes are there how the number of potholes have reduced in new data set or in the current scenario that's what in the layman language we can make a inference out of it so what it shows what what the inference it has so for the automotive industry the proof load cases have not changed however the fatigue damaging load inputs have reduced drastically because the cycle count has reduced so earlier we have seen overall road now if you zoom it more into the same plot but the best upon the road types like in national highway how does it looks like so we see that there is a improvement in the overall cycles have reduced similarly on state highways probably much improvement is seen similarly city roads there is improvement even rural 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 roads have improved lot so we see that overall the cycle counts have come down now based upon this data whatever we collected we did a pseudo damage analysis between again two data sets old and new data set now we looked at the wheel forces at front and rear wheels and then if i take the pseudo damage if i to compare the new data new data what i acquired with how it stands with respect to the old data then it shows me that if old is one like 100% then the new data is about the severity of the load data the pseudo damage of the data is reduced more than half almost by 60% there is a reduction into the damage similarly same signature same inference we see from the strain data as well so nutshell the overall vehicle level damage due to the road inputs when compared between old data set which is era 2000 and new data set which is 2020 it has reduced that is that is something very eye opening for us and this is something very important to know and understand this As, a, as earlier we have seen like we have seen the four vehicles four class of vehicles so we have seen similar so similar analysis we did for all other all uh, five four types of vehicles 
and more or less we see that the damage has reduced in the range of say by 50 percent to 40 percent damage in some of the extent like in small commercial vehicle it is about 40 percent damage is reduced because of the duty cycle because it has influenced uh, the road network and the duty cycle also plays an important role here so but more or less in nutshell we can see that about 50 to 60 percent damage reduction is there across the applications be it a passenger car or heavy commercial vehicle Now, based upon this revised, based upon this understanding and learning, we have revised our, uh, based of revised our CA and test load cases, and we have retuned those test cases because we wanted to optimize the design. We wanted to gain on the weight reduction, cost reduction, in order to meet the current challenges. The lots of targets are there: the cost reduction targets, weight reduction targets. So we want. To, so we're looking for new avenues by which we can look into it. So this is one of the avenue we found out and used it. At the same time, it has since the number of cycles have reduced. What I mean, the test cycles. Earlier, suppose we used to test for one million cycles. Now that has come down to six lakh cycles five lakh cycles so that there is a test time reduction as well so 30 to 40 percent of test time we could able to reduce and of course testing is not is very costly affair actually is not so simple so resources required has also reduced drastically in one of the commercial vehicle program we could able to reduce the frame weight by 12 percent and of course the associated dmc metal cost as well so these are the uh, benefits and avenues we have observed through revisiting the road load revisiting the test cases the ce test cases and the physical test cases retuning them with current infrastructural changes so it's helped a lot now to conclude i'll just say this is something not an end this is i'll say beginning for everyone for indian oems as such because this journey just started probably it will go long and and it this ex, and such exercises needs to be continued until the road infrastructure really matures in line with the development this something will continue and we have to keep on revisiting and retuning the test and CA load cases to get the benefit out of it. That's all from my side. Thank you very much for kind listening. And uh, over to you, or if any questions are there, I will be happy to answer. Over to you. Thank you, sir, for the excellent presentation on topic, a study of effect of road infrastructure changes on structural fatigue damage. Thank you. We have one additional presentation, final presentation number seven on topic, ICAT capabilities in DVP testing and durability by Mr. Ratandeep Ghosh. I now request Mr. Ghosh to proceed with his presentation, sir. Is the screen visible? Yes, sir, your screen is visible. Yeah. 
so uh, lastly i just want to focus on uh, our icats capabilities in the dvp and durability related testing uh, that we have been con con uh, conducting over the years so so it can be broadly classified into structural durability the data acquisition and simulation and the vibration related testing now in the structural durability we have component level aggregate level and vehicle level in uh, data acquisition uh, and the simulation uh, first we uh, have the data acquisition capabilities uh, on road and also inside the chamber and simulating the data in the two two three and four posters and the exact performance both both inside the lab as well as uh, at the outside real world usage pattern uh, in the vibration category we have single axis multi axis uh, vibration along with coupled with the uh, climatic chamber along with solar simulation and temperature and humidity control sir sare dikha raha hai mere mein to panelists sare baithe okay uh, i would request uh, uh, amritansh can you please uh, switch off your uh if you talk about testing and validation then the attribute uh, structure it can be divided into uh, this following categories amongst this uh, the pd performance economic and and durability vehicle dynamics durability thermal and aero vehicle evaluation in which electrical and press upon this i'll be specifically focusing on durability and the thermal related testing out here uh, so these are the few of the projects which you have done if you talk about the road load data acquisitions rld of car uh so uh the project scope basically is uh ride and comfort analysis voice band over here na perfect voice perfect voice kar dese voice band over here Voice is not coming. so we cannot hear you
so your voice is not audible i think due to technical issues we cannot hear you okay we uh, shall be moving to question and answer section and uh, the first question is Yes, the first question is from Ms. Nivedita N. And this question is to Mr. Satya Prakash. What are the eight design variables used? Mr. Satya Prakash, so. Yeah, yeah, am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Yeah, okay. See, here. <clears throat> The eight design variables what we used are see six were from load. See, there are six loads which can vary. This means three three forces, Fx, Fy, Fz, and three moments, Mx, My, Fz. And apart from that, the material strength can vary because of which the fatigue properties of the material can vary. And the next property was the geometry variation, which is represented by the variations in KF or the stress concentration, fatigue stress concentration factor. So this is again a function of the critical radius at the hot spot. So when the radius differs, so when you look up the table, you will get to know what are the variations in the KT or the hot spots which are present. So these were the six variables which were used to set up the DOE and for which so six plus to eight, six loads and uh, two were the uh, the, the geometry and the material strength parameters. So eight eight different variables. For each variable, uh, when you start the first iteration, the thumb rule is you have 10 points. So 10 into 8, 80 point DOE was set up. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question is to Mr. Satya Prakash. And this question is from Mr. Pankaj Lokhande. And the question is, can we use this predictive analytics for a product having a blending as well as a torsional load, which lead to high and low cycle fatigue? For this product having more than 10 load cases, can you please explain? Yes, we can. Because there is no limit for this. To be uh, So what you need is if there are 10 load cases, so your, the number of DOEs which you have to set up initially, and one more thing you have to take care is if the variations are huge, so then 10 load cases may not be enough. So what we do is we start with a first iteration, design iteration, so and say that, okay, 10 into 10, 100, 100 DOEs you set up, and you generate data, either physical test or through a simulation. I'm assuming it's from a simulation, where it will go through all the bending, bending loads, the axial loads, and all the torques. So means all the torsions which are there. So then from this, when you set up the stage one emulator and then uh, if that emulator gives you fairly good accuracy, you see oh, for a predict, for something to become predictive, you say that anything which can give up to, let's say 5% accuracy, means the worst error you can make is about 5%. So if it becomes predictable, predictive within 5% of the required results, so then you are good enough. Means, yes, you can. There's no, there's no restriction on that. So the whole concept of this predictive analysis is based on data in and data out. So you can have 50 variables. So because these programs have been very successfully used on uh, jet engine. So the company with whom we are collaborating in the US. So they started this company just because uh, Pratt and Whitney, uh, they were one of the biggest jet engine, jet engine makers. So they had a problem how to predict the predictive maintenance schedules of their jet engines, which are used worldwide on jets. So in that case, there will be 300, 400 parameters which are monitored through sensors. So the whole thing is built up into a digital twin and you're monitoring and you're predicting in future what will happen. So because of this instantaneous changes in load conditions, what would be something which would need by maintenance for which I have to stop and then attend to the maintenance. So. Basically, this is a data agnostic. Any amount of data coming in, 
no no restriction on the number of variables which will be there okay thank you sir next question is to mr girish chivan and this question is from mr pankaj lokande and the question is how we will play a role in durability and reliability so can you repeat the question please yes sir how we will players roles in durability and reliability we will play the role yes sir, yes, sir. Ah, okay. Uh, in uh, Weibull analysis, specifically talks about the uh, giving the idea about the uh, in Weibull analysis, there are three important parameters are there. One is the ETA parameter, which talks about the shape. When we say shape, means it talks about the failure mechanism or uh, failure uh, methodology. And there is another parameter which talks about the ETA, that is uh, scale parameter, which interprets about the uh 63 uh, percent of the life of uh, uh, of a product or of that uh, uh, test component so this viable parameter plays a role in terms of uh, reliability analysis that is the shape parameter which is uh, which gives the failure mechanism idea and which can be as it is implemented for the uh, for example if you, you are doing it for steering knuckle or you are doing it for some frame uh, structure or the aw structure the same shape parameter you can uh, use it for the future or uh, 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 very less number of samples uh, 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 durability testing uh, uh, reliability testing and the scale parameter itself gives the idea about the life of uh, uh, the interpretation about the uh, life uh, in terms of uh, usable life of up to 63 percent so that help, uh, helps for the uh, giving the uh, indication on the durability uh, durability life of uh, uh, of the component or the product okay thank you sir and the next question is to mr girish chivan and uh, this question is from ashish gaurav the question is if the confidence level and reliability target is defined how to find out the number of samples to be tested at accelerated load to Mr. Girish Chivan. Yeah. Uh, so, yes. Yes. Uh, I'm. I'm audible, right? So uh, there is a, a book on, or there is a formula which has come out of uh, reliability. Anyways, talks about the confidence level. Uh, so number of sample selection is the combination of. Uh, uh, I, if you want to increase the confidence level. Uh, like 90 percent to 95 percent then your number of samples will be increased uh, and if you are uh, reducing the confidence level there will be your number of samples will also get reduced but it, if, you, if we can visualize the graph of our i would like to present it but uh, i don't know whether i am in position to present it so uh, there is a formula available for uh, using the confidence level and reliability target we can identify the number of samples if uh, uh, he can just uh, ping me, I can share you that uh, particular paper on that or the formula to the uh, person, not an issue. I can't remember that formula in front of me, but it is giving the reliability is equal to uh, number of samples and uh, it has the extra uh, exponential formula. Uh, uh, there is a combination of formula which uses the exponential functions to uh, uh, get the number of samples. That, that I will definitely help him out by sharing the formulas with that. Okay. Okay. Thank you again, sir. That formula is not last uh, available yeah. with me in front of uh, in front of the screen. Yeah, I will put it in the chat box also if required. Okay. So that will help sure, him. Sir. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We're taking last question and this question to Mr. Sri Shatya Pakas. And this question is from Mr. Sri Neeraj. And question says, what software we can use to perform predictive analytics? Mr. Satir Prakash, sir. Yeah, yeah. See, the pre predictive analytics, there are a lot of software. So basically what we are using, see, it's all about 
uh, using the relevant uh, machine learning algorithm. So if you are, so if somebody, for example, is a Python user, even a lot of freebies are available. So you'll be able to set up. See, the only thing is, it's easy to use any open source software, but it should have it should be easy to use for you, and then it should be proven for your case and over. The the point of view is here. If 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 there are only like a hundred or two two hundred inputs which are coming, so any open source software like that will work. Suppose there is there are there are million kind of inputs which are coming, so you need something a robust software. So what we use at our end, it is from a company called a Smart UQ. We are working with them, so we represent them in India. So this is a US based company who specialize in uncertainty quantification. So as we spoke. In predictive analytics, uh, uh, the uh, setting up of a predictive analytics statistical model, which is the heart of that for that machine learning algorithms, you know, they are they are a must, and then they are the form the heart of that. So this particular company, they have uh, they have their own uh, algorithms which have been proven. Even um, what I told you is they first started working not on an automotive but on a jet engine. Which have been very successful, and then now they are percolating down the line, going to the oil industry, coming to the automotive sector, and they are across simulation, even medical medical equipment. So, so how how uh, how example uh, medical surgeries? So, how do you replace a stent? What are the uncertainties which are there? So, with 99.99 percent certainty. So how do you, what are the parameters which can go into a stand? So these are some of the actual case studies which have been done. So it is like limitless. And these are the things which should come up in the future and which should readily get imbibed into any process where uncertainty is there. The whole world has uncertainty. So for more details about the software and this company, it's called Smart UQ, S-M-A-R-T, Smart UQ. And Somebody wants more details about that because we are working with them and they can get in touch with us. We'll provide uh, uh, more inputs into that and uh, probably help them to get along uh, this new idea. Thank you, sir. Now I request all the delegates to kindly mail us with your queries and we will get back to you through our reply from our eminent speakers. Thank you all eminent speakers. Now, moving towards the end of the webinar, I would like to invite Shrimati Pamela Tikku, Senior GM and Chief Business Officer ICAT for delivering vote of thanks. Ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Thank you, Amritanj. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it has been a very interesting session today, um, and I've been listening to the uh, uh, various presentations today and it was a very engrossing session and i'm sure that uh, the topic is of such a great interest that you know you can spend uh, many more hours on this and still you will feel unsatisfied that you have not got copies of all the uh, questions you have uh, having said so uh, i'm uh, on behalf of icat i would like to extend my hearty vote of thanks to all the attendees for sparing their time to be amongst us through this webinar uh, on the knowledge of fatigue durability related technology. I also convey my sincere thanks to all the speakers, Sri Santosh Gosavi from Tata Motors, Sri Satya Prakash from Mahesh Software, Sri Girish Chavan from Tata Consultancy Services, Sri A. Kalidasan from Dusan Bobcat, and Sri Sujit Singh from HBK India. Shri Prashant Vishay and Shri Ratnadeep Ghosh from ICAT, who all have given their time and uh, be, been with us today uh, in spite of the regular responsibilities that all of you share. This event is organized as a part of week-long celebration of Ministry of Heavy Industry, Azadi Kamrit Mahotsav, A Kam it is called, which is an initiative of Government of India to celebrate and commemorate 75 years of independence in progressive India. Through these uh, interactions, Government of India is trying to catalyze uh, the need for India to become a bigger growth center for the uh, world. 
and hence a lot of ministries all the ministries all the government departments are taking key initiatives to uh, propagate the idea of progressive india and how to make india a better nation a progressive nation i'm sure through this webinar we were able to bring value added knowledge in the field of durability relevant subjects like data acquisition techniques damage correlation reliability engineering which are integral part of product development and validation cycles of components and vehicles and other products are you able to hear me yes ma'am we are able yes. to hear you yes very much okay so it was a very interesting session it started with uh, simulation then you know that is uh, development of vehicles through softwares components through softwares then uh, you know on road uh, road being the lab which is a constantly evolving uh, laboratory for uh, especially people who are involved in durability and validation and then bringing that lab road to the lab itself and hence the completing the process of product development from concept to on road to the lab uh, validation iket is a developing into a pioneer institute in this field of experience and are deliv delivering exemplary services in the area of past since five uh, few years and we are taking up certain interesting and challenging projects and i'm happy to share that my team uh, has been able to deliver uh, to the customer requirement and satisfaction although this is not a subject which is very clearly understood and defined it's a constant evaluation of both the customer and the client and agreeing upon what the expectation of customer is we request you to write to us in case you have any specific requirement for such services from icat which includes uh, simulation on road testing or in lab testing we are extremely grateful to uh, mr dinesh tyagi director icat for constantly supporting in all our endeavors and inspiring us to organize events like this especially under the ministry of heavy industry under whose aegis we are are organizing these events a week long events uh, under azadi ka amrit mahotsav i would like to congratulate team organizing team under the leadership of samir shigalkar along with the icc team under mr anurag jain supported by a team of fatigue lab and icc team to put this content together and organize this uh, webinar seamlessly uh, although there were certain glitches which are so not sometimes in our control but then they have been able to manage uh, nicely we thank all of you for being with us today it's been a great pleasure and i thank you all once again let us all celebrate azadi ka amrit mahotsav with great vigor and pride jai hind jai bharat thank you ma'am for your kind words thank you i once again thanks to all the eminent speaker mr satya prakash mr surjit s kujral mr girish chavan Mr. A. Kalidhasan, Mr. Santosh Gosavi, and Mr. Ratandeep Ghosh for taking out their time from their busy schedule and gracing this webinar with the presence and insightful presentations. I thank all the delegates and attendees for their attention and active participation. I hope you found this webinar informative and useful. Thank you all for signing in. With this, yeah. I will be concluding this webinar. wishing you all a nice day ahead stay safe stay healthy thank you and namaste thank you very much to the icat team and all the attendees thank you thank you thank you sir International Center for Automotive Technology ICAT The most populous democracy in the world the Republic of India is a vast South Asian country 
with diverse terrain ranging from the Himalayan peaks to Indian Ocean coastline and a history dating back five millennia. A cultural melting pot, it is a pluralistic, multilingual and multi-ethnic society which became one of the fastest growing major economies post market based economic reforms in 1991. A key contributor to this enviable position is the automotive industry which accounts for 7.1% of the country's gross domestic product GDP located at the northern hub of automotive industry in Manesar Haryana. ICAD has emerged as a comprehensive technical partner to the automotive industry and renders valuable services such as homologation and certification, developmental projects and testing and automotive R&D projects. The state-of-the-art infrastructure at ICAD is pivotal in carrying out these functions and can be broadly classified into following areas of excellence. Powertrain Laboratory Powertrain Lab offers services in the fields of vehicle and engine emission and performance test along with calibration services. The labs are fully equipped to undertake the homologation test of both the engine and the vehicle as per latest Indian, European and other international regulations of automobiles. Apart from homologation, performance measurement of engine and vehicle, fuel consumption measurement and optimization, Emission tests and optimization including EGR, engine mapping, exhaust temperature optimization and ECU calibration of vehicles. Engine test cell ETC There are 13 transient test cells ranging from 35 kilowatt to 880 kilowatt capacity. These engine test cells are capable of carrying out advanced tests such as performance, optimization, emissions measurements, EGR and SCR optimization, durability and validation for engines for various automotive and no automotive applications. Vehicle Test Cell VTC there are six emissions vehicle chassis dynamometers and three mileage chassis dynamometers capable of testing vehicles up to 5,000 kg GVW. Each test cell is equipped to test and check various emission parameters such as hydrocarbon, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxides and particulates as per BS6 and Euro 6 norms and durability and validation. The lab is also equipped for an on-road emission performance. Vehicle Evaluation Lab VEL. Vehicle Evaluation Lab undertakes key tests including coast down, brake performance, maximum speed, fuel consumption, acceleration and performance, drivability trials, tire noise testing, endurance and durability tests, ABS test etc as per the specific needs of the customer on test tracks. Component Certification Lab CCL Component Certification Lab CCL provides services related to certification and homologation of automotive components. As per Central Motor Vehicle Rules CMVR, the lab undertakes developmental testing, environmental testing, vibration testing, hot and cold chamber, weatherometer, ozone chamber, salt spray chamber, walk-in chamber, etc. for all components for on-road and off-road vehicles. Photometry Lab Photometry Lab at ICAT is the state-of-the-art facility and one of the finest in the world. Fundamental research is carried out on LED measurement methods, spectroradiometric measurements techniques, visibility and glare, headlamp aiming, conspicuity, telematics etc. Not only does the lab cater to automotive lighting but also provides testing and development services to non-automotive applications which includes domestic lighting and aviation lighting. Materials Lab Multiple facilities available here in Materials Lab 
include mechanical testing of rubbers and plastics, coolant test facility, chemical testing of polymers, flammability testing of upholstery, carpet materials as well as inner components, wiring harness for kits used in automotive two, three and four wheelers etc. Fatigue lab. In order to ascertain the life of products, extensive tests are undertaken by OEMs and their vendors. These tests include durability and integrity assessment of vehicles, systems and subsystems under various driving and environmental condition. Fatigue Lab in ICAD has state-of-the-art facility wherein you can bring in roads to the lab evaluation, multi-axis simulation tables, exposters and various actuators in various simulated environmental conditions make this possible. Electromagnetic Compatibility Lab EMC the application of electronics has significantly increased in automobiles over last few decades. In view of this, the electromagnetic compatibility compliance has become of paramount importance both at the device as well as vehicle level. Passive Safety Lab simulates various crash scenarios. This is to ensure occupant and pedestrian protection in the event when a vehicle encounters a crash and the ability of the vehicle structure to absorb the energy of the impact. Some of the services offered are frontal impact crash test, side impact crash test, side pole impact, rear impact test, static rollover, pedestrian protection testing, etc. A notable point is that ICAN was the first organization to set up pedestrian safety lab in India. Tire Test Lab Tire being crucial for the road safety, comfort and fuel economy of the vehicle needs to undergo a comprehensive and rigorous testing to evaluate and ensure its adequate performance. Both performance and rolling resistance evaluation of tires for various category of vehicles is undertaken in this lab. Noise, Vibration and Harshness Lab A center of excellence on noise, vibration and harshness NVH is the first of its kind of facility in India to offer services for development of vehicles in components, testing and validation. The lab is equipped with the semi-anechoic chambers with chassis dynamometers and state-of-the-art equipment and instrumentation. Automotive Electronics and Electrical Lab The AEEL at ICAT is one of the most important lab considering the rapid increase in the use of electrical and electronics in the vehicles. The major facilities available at AEEL are related to electrical measurements, ECU validation, environmental testing, altitude testing, dust and water ingress testing, thermal shock, vibration and shock testing, weather resistance, battery cyclers and motor test benches etc. CAD CAE Lab CAD CAE Lab helps in design and development of vehicle and its component. Here components and vehicles are not only tested virtually but also studied for modification and optimization if required. Apart from virtual testing, it offers other services such as CAD modeling, drawings, fixtures and structure design. ICAD is poised to develop into automotive development center not only to provide certification services but also product development services to Indian and global OEMS. At ICAD, we constantly strive for excellence both in terms of building facilities and building matching skills. International Center for Automotive Technology ICAD